how did you get into this whole world of esoteric stuff and religion and the history of all of this? How, how did you get into this subject? Well, uh, I've been studying the occult, the esoteric, the conspiratorial for about 15 years now. Um, I'm 28 years old. I started researching this stuff when I was about 13, 14. A little bit, keep that thing a little bit closer. Uh, yeah, 13, 14. And, um, but prior to that, my entire life has pretty much revolved around this stuff. I've had a lot of experiences all throughout my life that have led me on this path. Um, primarily being uh, the fact that I grew up in a religious family, both Christian and Catholic. So as a kid, I never liked church, still don't like the institution of it or anything, but I was always fascinated by the Bible itself and the stories and everything. And so I always had that fascination for legends and the mysticism behind religions. And that fascination led me down this path as a kid. And also as a kid, I was always rebellious. I was the youngest of four. So um, I was influenced by my older brothers, listening to a lot of classic rock, uh, gangster rap and stuff like that. And was just a rebellious kid, never liked authority. It was always an independent thinker. And then so when I started, uh, you know, smoking cannabis and doing psychedelics and all that kind of stuff around 13, 14. Oof, that's young. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other thing, too. <laughs> and uh, while I was doing that, I was listening to a lot of uh, underground hip hop that spoke about a lot of the stuff. And so I, it was just all came together at that moment. You know, 13, 14, I started listening to the stuff, having experiences and already had previous experiences as a child. And so I really started digging into the stuff through books, through articles, through documentaries. And um, another experience, actually, real quick, that led me on this path as a young person was when my grandpa, who used to be a pastor, uh, told me that he had seen a UFO. And I was about eight years old. And um, he, he was always off in the corner, you know, smoking cigarettes ever since I was a kid. To this day, he still loves smoking his cigarettes off in the corner. <laughs> and that was always like a running meme for us, you know, like, oh, there, there's, there's grandpa, you know, just smoking his cigarettes. And I never understood why he was, you know, always out to him, always um, off with himself. And so one day when I was like eight years old, I asked him, you know, like, hey, grandpa, like, why are you always smoking cigarettes and looking at the sky? And he told me the reason was because he had seen a UFO and he was always kind of wanting to see another one. And he was always questioning existence and everything because of that. And so I remember asking him, knowing that he used to be a pastor and that we grew up in a religious family. Well, then what do you think about God? And he kind of just took a drag and looked up at the sky and said, I don't know. And so that kind of blew my mind as a kid, you know, being in a religious family and all this and that. Now was, the possibility of aliens was real. So I've had a lot of weird experiences throughout my life. And, and again, just, just getting into it as a young person, researching, reading. Um, I've been doing this ever since, you know, pretty much all my life, but more specifically the past 15 years. And um, again, my name is Eddie, uh, but I go by Esoteric Eddie online. But that incarnation as an artist is only about a year and a half old. I've only been doing this for about a year and a half under that name. My YouTube channel, my books, all that um, pretty much launched at the beginning of 2022. Prior to that, I had other incarnations as an artist, different names, different projects. And so I, I've always been trying to get this information out as an artist through different ways, but it's just redefined. And now through Esoteric Eddie, through that name, through that brand, everything's kind of been finally, you know, uh, being received well and, and I've gained some popularity and stuff like that. And it's just, it's been awesome to see where it's, where it's, uh, where it's you know, flourished and how it's blossomed. Mm. Yeah, I watched your uh, documentary about Lucifer this morning, which was wild. It's a great documentary, by the Thanks. way. Yeah. And it's crazy how like all this stuff from psychedelics to the different translations of all these religion religions, <clears throat> you know, come to be. And, and there's so many different translations. It's like it's it's easy to get sort of like lost in the sauce of what is what and all the different interpretations of it and how it relates to history. And and, um, you know, it just to me, it seems like there is just a, a variety of different cultures who interpret things that just happen in the world, possibly a different way, such as like the floods and stuff like that. Yeah, man. Yeah. So what I'm here to talk about is pretty much my newest book, which is on consciousness. But p before we get into that, I want to talk about my other two books, which is The Lucifer Mystery Revealed and yeah. The Anunnaki Theorem. And that's kind of like my expertise in the 
truther community, if you will. Mm. You know, a lot of my friends and, and the people in the community come to me um, for information on like ancient religions and ancient cultures. Um, so that's what I do. I, I kind of deconstruct and deprogram institutional narratives of religion and, and now consciousness. And But I approach everything from a neutral, unbiased you know, perspective, mm. pretty much just like a historian. Yeah, it's funny. How come the History Channel is like synonymous with talking about the Anunnaki? I used yeah. to only hear about it from like my crazy stoner friends, but now it's just like it's like mainstream conversation for people who watch cable TV. Yeah, and it wasn't always like that. Like, and the funny thing is too, like I remember being a kid and my grandpa was always watching Unsolved Mysteries. Like that mm -hmm. was like Ancient Aliens before Ancient Aliens. You know, Unsolved Mysteries. That's all they really had. Mm -hmm. and it was always the same stories, like the Betty and Barney Hill story of the first UFO abduction. And so I remember, I remember being a kid like watching that stuff too. But um, to your point, uh, I was talking about the Anunnaki and stuff like that way before Ancient Aliens, the TV show. I was like a freshman or even in eighth grade, like talking about this stuff because I had come across the work of Zechariah Sitchin, who, who made all this possible through his books in the 1970s. But I was talking about this stuff and trying to educate my friends and they always thought I was crazy, like, man, you're fucking crazy, whatever. But I remember being um, in ninth grade, sitting on my friend's couch, smoking cannabis, you know, just chilling. And then the, the first episode of Ancient Aliens airs. And I was just freaking out, like, what? Like, yo, I started calling everybody over to the, to the living room, like, yo, this is the stuff I've been trying to tell you about. Like, so I remember that moment and I stopped watching after like the second season when I when I saw the agenda or whatever. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a money machine now and they kind of play the same narrative. And so in my book, The Anunnaki Theorem, I kind of just looked at everything through my own perspective, through a clear perspective. Do you think, what do you think it had more to do with your interest, your early interest in this stuff? Was it, like you said, trying psychedelics at a super young age, or was it your early indoctrination into religion and your religious family? I think it was the indoctrination part. You know, that's where it all started. Like one of my earliest memories, one of the earliest core memories that I have, I must have been like four or five or something. I remember my mom dropping me off at the, the kids section at a Catholic school or Catholic church. And I remember walking into this, this auditorium or whatever, and I was small, so everything looked bigger to me. So I remember walking in there and being just like overwhelmed by how big the room was. Mm. And then there was this huge painting of Jesus just staring over us. And I remember just freaking out, like, who is this guy, you know? And so, like, that image just, like, was in my mind. And then when I, as I grew and learned the, the teachings and everything, so it all started with religion mm. and specifically with my, you know, authorities and elders telling me that the devil was real and that demons were real. So as a young kid, I thought demons and the devil were real and, like, like they were out to get me and stuff like that. And that played a huge part in how I viewed the world and played a huge part in, in, uh, in my fear and in my traumas. But as I... As I said, I was always rebellious too, so I never liked authority. Yeah. And so that rebellion is what saved me because I always thought for myself. You know, like I remember listening to Pink Floyd and Bob Marley and stuff like that when I was like, you know, third grade, you know, so I had that rebellious and like independent spirit. And so when I came across these books and these videos and stuff in like eighth grade, ninth grade, it just shattered everything and it all made sense in that moment. Like, oh, wow, I could see it. I could see like all the indoctrination and everything. There's something about religion is that when we're young and you get, it's forced on you. Like when I was young, I was, my parents dropped me and my brother off at Sunday school and we would have to go to church and stuff like that. And it was just like, you know, when you go home and you start listening and you see like black Sabbath and Marilyn Manson on TV, you're like, this is way fucking cooler. Yeah. But like when you get older, people start, generally i feel like people start to accept it more or understand it more and embrace it more but there's like a there's something that happens like as we age where we kind of we understand it better and yeah. we're, we're not so opposed to it or inclined to rebel against it i feel like maybe it's something like we get closer to we're getting closer to death maybe that has something to do with it like we're not because we're getting closer to death it's kind of like it's it's not a closed loop right there's like it's a it's an open loop so we're not sure what's going to happen so it's it's easier to sort of like accept it maybe yeah well it's part of uh, the human process you know we've been worshiping things since the beginning and it's it's all been developing and that's kind of part of what i'm going to talk about today is is how this idea of worship and god has developed over the millennia it just became it's just gotten more and more complex and in some cases for the wrong reasons so we've always had to cope with death and stuff like that and i feel like 
way back in the day when we were more primitive, we had we had a much more healthy relationship with that. It was much more beautiful and more accepted. And it was like, we accepted it. It was beautiful. But like now we have all this like weird religious stuff and weird like laws and morals and ethics that get in the way. But um, I think actually that we're starting to move away from the Abrahamic faiths in a, in a sense. Not that they're not good for us, but it's just that we're starting to see that there's so much more to life. And that's also a part of what I'm going to talk about today um, in my third book, which is about consciousness. It's like we can view life through these Abrahamic religions, but they're just very specific set of perceptions and philosophies. And there's a whole nother life outside of all of that. Do you think that God and angels are just aliens? <laughs> Uh, I mean, to a certain extent, I used to believe that a lot when I first got into this stuff, like 13, 14. And the reason being is because of Zechariah Sitchin. You know, he's, if you don't know, so Zechariah Sitchin, he's the guy who brought all of this Anunnaki stuff uh, to the forefront in the 70s. You know, he, he wrote the first books on the Anunnaki. And so in other, wor in other words, without Zechariah Sitchin, there would be no ancient alien TVs. There probably would be no Billy Carsons, none of that you know, at all, you know, without him or Eric Von Daniken. Um, so I read his books and, and he was a, a prolific biblical uh, scholar too. You know, you could say like mm. he, he didn't try to disprove the Bible. He tried to like bring even more veracity to it, but saying that, you know, we're looking at it in a, in a, a skewed way. He's the one who said that these angels and these beings are actually these ancient astronauts and stuff like that. Hmm. So, and his books are fascinating. They're very detailed. He goes hard or whatever, but I have my own uh, critiques about him, and like most people do after they read his works after many, many years. So I kind of just like put all his stuff to the side and kind of looked at all this stuff myself and for what it is and, and came to my own conclusions. Mm. But to answer your question, are angels and demons just aliens? I mean, we could perceive them that way, but I go further than that, further than that and I say that these archetypes never really existed. And that's what my first book is about, The Lucifer Mystery Revealed. You think they were just sort of stories that were told to keep society in line, just to be like, here's the difference between good and bad. In order for us to operate as a society, don't kill, don't steal, don't rape people. Like, that's not a good way to live. And you develop these stories that people be can read and become fascinated by and even whether you know it's whether you believe in it or not, it's still sort of a way for society to operate, sort of like boundaries. Yeah, basically in simple, but it's it's more complex than that. And uh, I guess we can kind of just get into it. Mm. Let me explain why it's more complex. And the reason it's complex is because the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, they're all uh, based on even more ancient mythologies. And they've kind of just borrowed these mythologies for their own purposes. And monotheism, primarily through Judaism first, was created for the purpose of, of controlling the populace. And so that's a simple way to put it, but let me, let me give you some deeper examples. Um, and also apart from that, a lot of this religious stuff uh, has just come about through mistranslations, misinterpretations, mm -hmm. and exaggerations. Right. For example, charlatans charlatans as well and for example lucifer right so lucifer plays a huge role in christianity and in just in in western pop culture this this and that right you know the, the occult loves lucifer the christians abhor lucifer but lucifer never existed in the bible and the the reason why we created that archetype was because we had misunderstood and mistranslated the hebrew text so the entire world learned about Lucifer through one verse in the Torah, which is Isaiah 14, 12. And that's the famous verse that goes, O Lucifer, how art thou fallen, etc., etc." And um, we, we translated the word Lucifer into the English as an uppercase noun, a name with a, with a big L. But we mm -hmm. got the English from the Latin. And the Latin is where the word Lucifer is first uh, shown to us because it's a Latin word comprised of two root words, lucis, light, and fere, uh, which means to bring or to hold. And that's where the occult got the idea of Lucifer being the light bearer or light bringer. Mm. But we got the Latin version from the Greek version. And in the Greek where we would see Lucifer, we would see the word phosphorus, 
which is equivalent to the Greek Latin, or sorry, which is equivalent to the Latin Lucifer, which means light or fire mm -hmm. or okay. bright. But we got all of those from the Hebrew, which, which is uh, Hillel ben Shahar. And Hillel ben Shahar means Hillel, son of Shahar. And the word Hillel means bright or shiny. And so that's where we got Lucifer, son of the morning, Hillel ben Shahar, because Shahar also means morning. Right? Okay, yeah. But there's a reason why that is used in the Torah. Isaiah was a royal prophet and a royal scribe, and he was writing during the time of the Babylonian exile, when the Babylonians were descending upon the kingdom of Judah and taking them all into captivity. And so he was writing a prophecy about the downfall of the Babylonians, saying that they are like Hillel ben Shahar. Hillel ben Shahar was actually a Canaanite deity belonging to an old mythology before Judaism. And in that mythology, Hillel was a younger god who tried to rise to the throne, but failed. But it gets even deeper. Um, the word Hillel, the Greek word phosphorus, the, the Latin word Lucifer are all words that could be used to describe or denote Venus. Mm. And Venus is the brightest celestial object in the sky preceding the sun. Right. And so uh, Hillel uh, was another version of an ancient um, Canaanite deity known as Athtar. And Athtar was a male rendition of the uh, female um, Astarte who was also Ishtar, who was also Inanna. And all of these goddesses were also um, represented by the star or the, or the symbol of Venus. And so Isaiah was, was prophetically and poetically saying that the Babylonians are like Venus, they are like Hillel. They think they are something bright and shiny, but they will soon be overshadowed by God or the sun. The sun, yeah. So that's what he was really saying. So the early Christians... Um, kind of looked at this and we're, we're like, oh, wow, like he's talking about some person named Lucifer. But we totally just took that and ran with it and, and exaggerated it. And so there never was a Lucifer. And so we took that, ran with it. And, and primarily, um, Oregon, so there, we say there never was a Lucifer. Well, they mentioned Lucifer and it was, the L wasn't capitalized, meaning it wasn't a person. Yeah. So, so what it was a symbol. Well, Lucifer is a Latin word. And it was a it was the translation of Halal Ben Shahar. So there never was a Lucifer character. And when I say there's there never was a Lucifer character, what I mean is there was never this right hand angel that was the leader of some choir who rebelled against God and then was cast down right. to earth. That's okay. the whole Lucifer mythos. That was put together over hundreds of years by Christians, but it all started with the mistranslation of what Isaiah was saying. Oh, okay. So Elel Ben Shahar was the source of, of what we created. Yeah. And it's kind of like, okay, so what? But the reason that's important is because if you, if you break down what, what Isaiah was doing, then it kind of opens up a whole other discussion because what he was doing was he was referencing even older Canaanite mythologies and this is what this whole Anunnaki thing is based off of. The whole Anunnaki thing is based off of the fact that Judaism, which is basically the first Abrahamic religion, is all based off of the Anunnaki tales. And um, I, can give you, I can give you an even crazier example. For example, um, in Genesis 126, right, when man is being created, you can open up any English Bible to this day and go to Genesis 126, and it'll read, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And there is plurality there. If you were to ask any theologian or whatever and be like, you know, why is there a plurality there? Mm -hmm. They would give you some cute answer like it's God talking to himself or God talking to Jesus or whatever but that's not the truth the reason there's plurality there is because the word that was used in, in the Hebrew text the original was not God the word that was used was Elohim and Elohim is a plural word meaning the powerful ones so if you go back and read Genesis 126 with that in mind now you're reading the powerful ones said let us make man in our image after our likeness so who are the powerful ones? Well, the powerful ones are the Anunnaki. And the, the reason that, that that is so and how we know that is because the people who wrote the Bible, they were from the Middle East. You know, they, they right. lived in that area. They lived closer in time to the ancient Babylonians, Sumerians. to ancient Sumeria and all that. So the Sumerians were their ancestors. They, they knew those tales by heart. 
You know, for example, the uh, Sumerian Enuma Elish was reenacted every year in Babylon at the Akitu New Year Festival. So these were their ancestors. They knew these tales. They implemented them into their new religion. What is the Enuma Elish? The Enuma Elish is the uh, Sumerian cosmological tale, the tale of how the universe was created. Okay. And there's a, I get into that in, in my book, The Anunnaki Theorem. Mm-hmm. And also real quick, if anybody's interested to learn more, I have free documentary versions of both my Lucifer book and the Anunnaki book on my YouTube channel mm-hmm. that you can check out. Um, but yeah, so what I'm saying is, is the Bible, the Torah, whoever wrote it, and we still aren't even clear on as to who wrote, really wrote it, whoever wrote it was writing it with the Anunnaki stories in mind and not just their stories in mind, but a lot of the other religions around them in mind. And when we look at the text, they're still fascinating. You know, for example, the oldest piece of literature known to us right now is a Sumerian text known as the Kesh Temple Hymn. And it's a strange text. It's about, uh, I don't know, something somewhere around 4,000 to 3,000 years old. But, um, it's a, it's a strange text. When you read it, it it's basically just these gods, and they, they call them the Anunnaki in the text. These Anunnaki putting together some kind of ritual or ceremony. That's all it is. It's like they're like getting these like instruments and like these smoking devices or whatever, mm-hmm. and they're like putting together a ritual. And this is one of the, this is the oldest text known to human humanity. Mm. So it's like, what is that about, you know? And so in, in my book, I conclude that these people these Anunnaki weren't aliens they weren't interdimensional travelers I don't doubt that possibility but the reason I think that is because if we read the text for what it is they they tell you what's going on and so right alongside the Kesh Temple hymn we have the Enkian World Order text which is just as old one of the Enkian World Order yeah the Enkian World Order text and what it is is the god Enki constructing society he's kind of like uh, appointing all these other gods to their positions in society like okay you're going to take care of this farm you're going to take care of agriculture and this this and that and in the text he also devises the calendar and so if you're reading this you you would think that they're doing this for the first time that these are the magical gods of creation you know creating everything but what tells me that this isn't them creating this for the first time is is this simple passage in the text um, where it is said that Enki uh, noticed that there were these nomads on the outskirts, known as the Martu nomads, and he noticed that they were with, that they were without resource, and so that he he hooked them up with resource, whatever, like a house, some animals, <laughs> and so if these are supposed to be the gods of creation, who are these Martu nomads on the outskirts, right? So I'm reading this as if these beings are reconstructing society. You know, they're having to reconstruct everything and build everything from the ground up. And on the outskirts, there are these disenfranchised people. So if we look at anthropology, geography, and all that stuff, we know that there have been cataclysms in recent history. Right. And so we don't need to go deep into that. But so what I think is that these beings were just survivors. They were survivors of the cataclysms. And they were savvy and clever enough to rewrite themselves in history as the gods. And the Sumerians were, when were, when uh, was the ancient Sumerians, when were they? Approximately uh, like 4,500 BC. 4,500 BC. Okay. So like, I, so I believe that the most recent world ending cataclysm was the younger driest impact hypothesis, which was 12,500 years ago, roughly. Yeah. Yeah, man. So it wasn't that long ago. It really wasn't. Our current timeline is like 7,000 years. You know, our mm-hmm. all the entire history of humanity on this globe right now, or flat Earth, whatever you believe, mm-hmm. is flat on, Earth. <laughs> Good God, is uh, it's only 7,000 years old. Like that's puny. Yeah. You know, and to think that that's all we've ever known mm-hmm. is is arrogant because we already know that's not true because we have places like Gobekli Tepe mm-hmm. that are like 9,000 to 14,000 years old. Right. So there was obviously civilization before this current 7,000 years. Right. And it's crazy that the that the people don't take it seriously. Like it's it's still considered not mainstream. It's like underground sort of like, you know, it's could be classed as like can some people classify it as conspiracy but there's like this war going on between like people on youtube researching it and people like randall carlson graham hancock and then fucking colleges like people yeah. at colleges who like or people who throughout history have like written books and been published about this stuff and have you know they don't like to be have their ideas challenged 
Yeah, man, I'm kind of in the middle of all of it. You know, I'm just kind of just reporting it all as like a historian. Mm -hmm. I try to look at it all from an unbiased, neutral standpoint. And so like getting back to the Lucifer stuff, because this is just one part of what I want to talk about. You know, this is the first book that I dropped. Um, but I just wanted to lay the, the groundwork for what I'm really going to get for what I'm really going to get into, which is consciousness and the simulation theory. But we'll, what we need to understand is that, for example, um, these religions, man, they're, they're built off of fallacies, you know, in some cases lies, but a lot of times they're just based off of human error. For example, this whole Lucifer thing, Lucifer never existed. You know, Isaiah was referencing an old Canaanite myth and he was using it poetically to talk about the downfall of the Babylonians. But it was the early Christian writers like Oregon Adamantius, um, specifically in, in the second century uh, AD or common era who, who took this and ran with it and exaggerated it. And it's just been exaggerated ever since. You think it's like the, the game of telephone over like history? Yeah, man, it was definitely like telephone and it was mostly just human error like we just weren't under you know there's a bunch of uh it was a bunch of um what do they call uh hellenistic jews and greeks yeah looking at um but i wonder if it was error if it was an intentional error i don't think so like oregon adamantius he was one of the dudes who like first looked at this and like created this archetype of lucifer and he was a wild dude he was later deemed a heretic because of his writings he was really wild like the way he thought about things mm. Um, but it, this didn't go unnoticed. For example, Martin Luther, the, the famous, you know, reformist, he spoke about this and, and, uh, he, he spoke about how there was never a Lucifer. He was smart enough to read this with the historical context in mind, as I'm explaining, like Isaiah was, he's an ancient dude who was closer to his ancestors, the Sumerians, but the, the early Christians were just so fanatical and reading it from their mind state of the new Testament or whatever. But this didn't go without, this didn't go unnoticed. You know, Martin Luther, he picked up on it like, yo, there's, there's no Lucifer. This is an error. Like we're reading this wrong, you know, and even the occultists, the famous occultists like Eliphas Levy uh, or Helena Blavatsky, um, who, are, who are huge players in the occult, the modern occult, they knew this too. But still, even though they knew that, they still played on the Lucifer archetype in philosophy and blew it up, and mm. which just made things even worse. Because it is a beautiful philosophy, if you think about it, you know, Lucifer being this bright angel who fell, and all he's trying to do is give us knowledge and, and upgrade our consciousness, you know. That's the whole story. But we're just putting all these puzzle pieces together that never really, uh, never initially were meant to be put together. He was trying to upgrade our consciousness? Yeah, so... Was he telling us to do drugs? <laughs> basically, yeah, yeah. Really? Well, basically, because... So you have Isaiah's verse with Hillel ben Shahar, and then uh, Christians like to couple that with the Garden of Eden story, which there's no, <laughs> there's no um, similarity there at all. There's no mm -hmm. connection. You know, they're just always piecing these different things together. So they'd like to take that and the Garden of Eden and then use it as evidence for there being a Lucifer archetype. But in the Garden of Eden story, we find this being called the serpent, right? And, he, and the word used, and it's always about the word. That's the thing these Christians don't understand is like, we have to look at the, the Hebrew, Middle Eastern contextual history and the word and everything. Mm -hmm. The word that was used uh, instead of serpent or, you know, originally was nakash. Mm -hmm. And Nakash is, is a double meaning word. It, it can mean serpent, but it can also mean wise one. And the, the, whoever wrote the Bible, they did a lot of this on purpose. They used a lot of words that could be playful. And there was a surface level understanding and a, and a more mystical, esoteric understanding. So the word Nakash, again, means serpent and wise. And um, that person, as I relate in my book, if there ever was a Lucifer who was a, a fallen angel who tried to like uplift us, it was that person. Um, in the Garden of Eden story, of course, a serpent, you know, tries to convince Eve to eat this apple or whatever it is, you know, consume this drug so that we will become like gods. That's what the Bible says. You know, eat of this, you will become like gods. And when we did eat it, again, in the Bible, there is a plurality. After we eat it, God says they have become like one of us. Go back, open your Bible. And I don't know what verse that is, but it's in Genesis 1. He's, God says they have become like one of us. Mm. And again, if you know, if you understand the ancient historical context, who they were talking about, these us were the Anunnaki, because that was the first religion, the first religion on earth, accor according to the, to the, con to the current 7,000 year timeline, the first religion, the first gods were the Anunnaki, those who, those were who our ancestors worshiped. Pardon this brief interruption, but I want to take a second to talk about our sponsor, Verso. 
Now, if you've heard this podcast before, chances are you already know how obsessed I am with health and longevity, which is why one of my favorite guests to have on the show is nutritional scientist and neuroscientist, Dr. Dom D'Agostino, who actually introduced me to this stuff. Verso is a company that is dedicated to translating scientific breakthroughs into products that hold the potential to increase longevity. The problem with aging is we accumulate these zombie cells or old damaged cells that linger beyond their useful life. These zombie cells infect other healthy cells, speeding up the aging process, causing things like hair loss, wrinkles, arthritis, cancer, dementia, and everything in the realm of aging. What scientists have realized is that we can manually induce autophagy, meaning the cleanup process of the old zombie cells and replacing them with new ones. Verso's new clean being, which I take every night, is a powerful blend of senolytic molecules that help promote the body's natural cleanup processes like autophagy and apoptosis, promoting better cellular health, supporting lower inflammation and natural cardioprotective functions, while boosting protection against age-related diseases. The three main ingredients in clean being are spermidine, lutolin, and dehydrocorsetin, which play key roles in the control of gene expression and are essential for cell growth and proliferation. Specifically, when it comes to cardiovascular and cognitive function, skin health, vision, and the immune system. Head on over to ver.so and use the coupon code CONCRETE at checkout to save 15% on your order. I linked it all below. Now back to the show. So all of that got condensed into one God, as I can get into. But getting back to the Garden of Eden real quick, Enki, the Sumerian God, he has always been known as the, the wise serpent. His symbol was always that of a snake or a serpent. And okay. he's, he's always been known as the god of knowledge and wisdom. For example, Senri, uh, Sir Henry Rawlinson, who was considered the father of Assyriology, the guy who started studying all this stuff after we pulled it out of the ground in the 1800s, he, he, he uh, concluded that it's clear to our ancestors that Enki was the god of wisdom and the god of the serpent and the snake. So again, whoever wrote Genesis was compacting all of this ancient mythology into this simplified version. And that's important. That's important because it's, it's a maybe deliberate erasure of our history, of who we really are, where we really come from, especially when we look at how monotheism was formed. And I'll get into that a little bit right now. So monotheism came forth through uh, Judaism primarily. Some people will say it started with Akhenaten and the sun worship or, or whatever, but primarily it started with uh, Judaism. And it all started with Abraham, right? So all three of the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, um, Islam, they all claim that, it, that Abraham was the patriarch, the father of all of these religions. So without Abraham, you wouldn't have the, the seed or the bloodline or the lineage of any of these religions. Okay. So it all starts with him, right? And if you open up the Bible and, and read Abraham's story, you learn that Abraham and his father, his family, were from Ur Kasdim of the Chaldees. So, and there's a lot of his, uh, debates within academia as to where it is, where was he really born? You know, was it this Ur or was it this Ur? And what's interesting about that is Ur was the capital of Sumer, which is modern day Iraq. Right. So the Bible's telling us possibly that Abraham was from Sumer. And the Bible tells us that prior to Abraham, his father, Terah, worshipped other gods. We are told this in the Bible. Um, in Joshua 24, specifically, we are told that Abraham's father worshipped other gods. So this whole idea of this one god was new with Abraham. And who were these other gods? Well, if we look back in history and, and, and listen to our ancestors, they tell you who these other gods were. They were the Anunnaki. Mm. By name, they say that. It's, and and Inki, so was Inki Lucifer? Yeah, basically, yes. He was? Yeah. And Inki had a brother, right? Yeah, and Lil. And Lil and Inki. And what was the difference between those two? So Enki means Lord of Earth. And then Enlil means Lord of the Command. And uh, basically, Enki was this more whimsical god who was always kind of creeping behind the other gods back to, to impart knowledge on us, impart wisdom on us. Mm -hmm. He had an admiration for us. Whereas Enlil was very vindictive and he didn't like us and um, he wanted to, to drown us in their flood story as well. But it was Enki in the Sumerian version who went against his brother's back and warned us about the flood. Uh, 
So there was always this like contention between the brothers okay. having to do with us. Okay, so back to Lucifer. Yeah, so so there was no Lucifer um, per se, you know. But again, if there ever was a Lucifer, it was Enki in the contextual story of the Garden of Eden. You okay. know, and so that's just important to know because it just shows how as humans we can take something and exaggerate it and create this whole thing out of it i mean there's a tv show now called lucifer right you know yeah it's a popular tv show it's all these things man and it all started with just a misunderstanding the crazy you know like i mentioned before we started the podcast that guy john marco allegro who spent most of his life he was a linguist studying this stuff studying the dead i think he spent a few decades just studying the dead sea scrolls and if I'm not mistaken, the Dead, Sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls were like the original source of everything, right? Kind of, sort of. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found them in the 1940s. Uh, and uh, what makes them interesting is that they have some of the oldest versions of some of the stories in the Bible. Right, okay. Some of the oldest remaining uh, versions. And where did the Dead Sea Scrolls come from? I always get those mixed up with the, the Nag Hammadi Library. But it mm. was because I think the Nag Hammadi were found, they were found at the same time, and they both have like very ancient and weird versions of the Bible. But uh, I think the Nag Hammadi was found in Egypt, and then the Dead Sea Scrolls were found somewhere also in between the Middle East and Egypt. Mm. But I don't know exactly. Yeah, but what John Marco Allegro came up with after all of those years of studying those Dead Sea Scrolls and deciphering them, you know, because it's it's such a it's such a sketchy thing when you're actually trying to decipher the words and figure out the meanings. Yeah. And that's what this guy's specialty was. And basically what he concluded was, was that these religions were ancient fertility cults and that they were consuming loads of psychedelics. Yeah, man. And there's a lot of that, you know, for sure. Uh, the, the Nakamani. What is this? The key, the Kerbet Quanram? Qumran. Qumran. Dead Sea Scrolls are ancient manuscripts that were discovered between 1947 and 1956 in 11 caves near Kerbet Quam Quamran. Qumran. Qumran. <laughs> Dyslexia is a bitch. On the northwestern shores of the Dead Sea. Okay. They are approximately 2,000 years old, dating from the 3rd century BC to the 1st century CE. BCE to the 1st century CE. They're, they have very strange versions, and along with like the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls too, or sorry, the uh, the Nag Hammadi Library, which are the the Gnostic texts. They're very psychedelic. But again, these were just these were just people basing their versions off of other versions, and just off of mythologies that go all the way back to the Anunnaki. And what were those ancient tablets that Billy Carson was telling me about? I did watch the, the video, but it's been a while, which I don't know. You're telling me he went to a, play, a, a library where he was able to actually look at and read some ancient clay tablets. I don't know uh, what he's referring to, but, okay. but we uncovered Sumer in the 1800s. So prior to the 1800s, we, we didn't know about Sumer. Sumer was already forgotten. There were some references to it in like Assyrian and Babylonian text, mm -hmm. and it was known in the Bible as Shinar. But in the 1800s, we found it in Iraq and started digging up all these clay tablets. And to this day, it's a, been reported that we've found about like half a million if we're being conservative. Mm -hmm. But even out of that half a million, only like maybe 10%, if that has been circulated uh, you know, throughout the public. Mm -hmm. And so these clay tablets are, are their texts from our ancestors talking about these Anunnaki and these beings and some other clerical and boring stuff too. But what I want to get into, if we can, to, to kind of just shift is, is monotheism and how that came about and how it was based off of the Anunnaki as well. Okay. So monotheism, again, it, it all pretty much started with Judaism, right? Mm -hmm. That's where this idea of Yahweh, uh, the, the one single God came from. But Judaism was formulated not that long ago. It, it all formulated around 500 BC, around there. 500 to 600 BC. And it came about after the Babylonian exile, which was a true occurrence in history. So what happened is the Babylonians descended upon all the neighboring kingdoms and started subjugating and taking the elite captive. They didn't take any of the common folk, just the elite. That was their practice. Take the elite captive and hold them or whatever. And during that Babylonian exile, um, the elite, they were, they were mingling, you know, they were being influenced by what was going on around them, right? 
And what happened was uh, King Cyrus, the Persian, he came through and he destroyed the Babylonians. And luckily, King Cyrus was tolerant towards other religions. So after he freed the Jews, he said, you can go back home if you want or you can chill here. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, some of, the, Babylon some of the, the Jewish priests decided to stay. And that's when the Babylonian Jewish priesthood began in Babylon. So there's two different priesthoods. And then some of the other ones went back home. But prior to the Babylonian exile, the Jews were um, losing their way. They were losing their footing. They were, they were reverting back to their polytheistic roots in the Anunnaki worship. And we're told this in, I believe, Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, we are told who was a prophet. He was alive during that time. We are told that the Jews, the people, the Israelites were, were reverting back to the days of their fathers and that they are worshiping as many gods as there are street names, as there are streets. So that they were reverting back to the Anunnaki worship. So because of that, they weren't fortified. They weren't unified. Everything was just just a mess. And that's mm -hmm. why they were easily, easily uh, controlled and, and taken over by the Babylonians. Oh, but, wow. Yeah. And so during the Babylonian captivity the the priests the elite were like man we can't let this ever happen again how are we gonna like you know come together and the bible tells us how this comes about the bible tells us why the torah was written we are told that the prophet ezra was given command by artaxerxes one of the kings of persia to go back to his kingdom to go back to his people and give them a new law a new law to follow and that new law was the torah the old testament and the reason they did that was so that they can control them, put them together, be unified. So basically, monotheism, Judaism came about after the Babylonian exile as a way to do away with the Anunnaki worship, to do away with polytheism. Oh, shit. Yeah. That's incredible. So it was a way to basically have security against people taking over your town. Yeah. Oh, Keep yeah. everyone together, unified under one God. Yes. Not divided. Yeah. That's wild, man. Yeah, and it gets crazier real quick. So Judaism is all based off of the worship of Yahweh. That's his name, right? Yahweh. But what's interesting is that the worship of Yahweh historically goes further back than the Jews. The earliest inscription of Yahweh that we have is actually found in the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula. And there was a band of these nomads known as the Shasu who were worshiping Yahweh in the Sinai Peninsula. And we know this because there's an Egyptian text that we found uh, where um, I think it's Amenhotep III, uh, he subjugated some of these, these Shasu and took them in as slaves. And he claims that these are the Shasu of Yahweh. And there are inscriptions in the Sinai that state, you know, this is our God, uh, Yahweh, and his consort, Asherah. So these Shasu were worshiping multiple gods. To them, Yahweh was just a part of their polytheistic pantheon. And it's, that's interesting because in the Bible, the first time the, the name Yahweh is given to us is in Exodus to Moses in the Sinai desert. So the Bible is also reflecting history. The Bible is telling us that the name Yahweh, this one God, was given to Moses in the Sinai desert where these people were already worshiping Yahweh. Hmm. And so it's just more proof, more proof that... All of this is just based off of the Anunnaki worship, the Anunnaki mythology. Mm -hmm. And it was just slowly fortified, slowly perfected until after the Babylonian exile, when they, when all of those kingdoms were gone anyway, where they said, you know what, let's take all of this and let's create our own thing, our own kingdom, our own religion, and let's go forward. Because at that time, the Sumerian kingdom was already well, was, was, was way gone. The Akkadian kingdom was gone. The Babylonians had just fell. The Assyrians were gone. So all that was left really were the Jewish, the Jews and some of the neighboring kingdoms and then the encroaching Greeks. And then slowly through time after that all fell, it was the Christian empire and the Jewish empire. Everything else had already pretty much crumbled. Right. And at that time, the Christians utilized the same blueprint because they were dealing with the pagan religions, all the pagan religions, this, this, and that. So they said, you know what, let's, you know, get rid of all of that. And let's just all make it one thing, Christianity. And what they did is they created uh, a power shift. They said, instead of having to go through Jesus, you know, to find God, you have to now go through the Catholic church. They, they created a, a mediation, you know, because before the, the, the original Christians, they didn't go to, 
these big churches or anything like that. They just worshiped together, communal. They were hippies. Mm -hmm. But the church came through and stamped its, its boot and said, no, now you have to go through us. We are the mediators between heaven. I wonder who the first person to come up with the church was. Yeah, well, technically they say it was- When was the was, first church? It was, I believe, in uh, Syria. Really? Yeah, yeah, but technically Paul was like the first one. Paul was the first one who, cre he's the one who created the Catholic church or the church, and then after him were the apostolic fathers who mm -hmm. followed after him in line. Kind of the same way that the Jews do with the rabbis. There was like an original rabbi, and ever since him, it's been like a secession. Right. But basically all this stuff, man, all of this stuff is just based off of the Anunnaki. It's just based off of the Anunnaki, and it's slowly just morphed and changed and condensed and become centralized. And here we are. Here we are. I just saw a video the other day of uh, Vladimir Putin, you know, doing some kind of cold plunge baptism or something. Cold Dude. plunge baptism? <laughs> really? Yeah, something weird like that. We got to find that. Yeah, yo. Uh, what was that all about? I don't know. I don't know what it was. Do you I think just... he knows about the Anunnaki? Well, what I was going to say is that before he did it, he like did a little Hail Mary cross, you know, because he's Eastern Orthodoxy over there. Right, right. So I'm just saying like, this is how pervasive this has become. Hmm. Oh, yeah, wow. Look at that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that. With a big cross right there. Look at that. Is that him? Too? Who's, oh, who's that guy? Yeah, that's a big thing in Russia. Hmm. Yeah, and they wear the wool hats when they do it. They do the cold plunge in the sauna. It's a big Russian thing. But it's, this is all for Jesus Christ. Wow, dude, I didn't know this. Yeah, so it just shows you how pervasive all of this is. I mean, religion is still a huge part of our world. I mean, he's what, you know, one of the leaders of, of the not-so-free world with a finger on the nuclear button, and here he is still indoctrinated by this stuff. Could you imagine seeing our president doing the cold plunge? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he probably wouldn't get back up. <laughs> He's like, oh. Um, yeah, man. But like, what do you think about the? What do you think about the fact that the only one people that are talking about the Anunnaki are people like yourself or the History Channel? I mean, it's weird, man. I think it'll eventually catch on. It means to who though? How would it? Well, who would it catch on with? Like, it, it's catching on because it's making money. Yeah, that's the reason it's catching on, and that's the reason a lot of people even start thinking about it and 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 reporting on it or doing things like you're doing. They get inspired by shit like these shows on the History Channel. So it's not a bad thing that they're making money. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, the History Channel, they're just fucking, you know, they're monopolizing this fucking shit and making it more fringe. But with, in reality, what they're doing is they're creating an, an economy around it. And they're cr creating more people like yourself who get fascinated by it and just dive into it and find out even more things about it. Yeah, yeah. And that's their focus for the most part is the money, right? And they're not telling the whole truth because they're always leading you to those cliffhangers of like, they were aliens and this and that. And it's like, you know, mm -hmm. like, okay, that's fun. It's entertaining. But like, let's get to the real truth. Like what's really going on? You know, and that's what I try to do. And, and for me, I started doing this because I was indoctrinated. I was indoctrinated. Like I'm telling you, like I used to really believe demons were real and the devil was out to get me. And I played a huge role. You don't in... think demons are real? No. Really? Yeah. Why not? Not in the... Are you sure they're not real? Well, let me say this. I don't think they're real in the way that the, the Christians perceive them to be. How do you think they could be real? Well, that's that's what I wanted to get to in, with my new book, per okay. se, because I just want to make sure there's nothing else I wanted to say on that um, with the Anunnaki and stuff, because we're going to get into like consciousness and, mm -hmm. and the possibilities of, of things like that being real. The reason I say demons are not real is because that's a perspective. For example, again, with the words, the word demon comes from the, the Greek word daemon, and daemon never, never meant uh, like an evil being. It, it was just a word that meant a god, a demigod. So the daemons were, they could be good, they could be bad. And um, a lot of times in the- Then who the fuck missed that translation? <laughs> a lot of these people, man. And why? They just weren't Because we, need, we needed a devil? I mean, maybe, maybe, okay, here's, a lot of this is just human error. 
That's what I'm starting to find, man. That's what, that's what I'm starting to find out. A lot of this is just human error. Like even in the truther community, for example, whatever that means, there's a lot of stuff is still exaggerated. Like I did a video recently on my channel about the famous Albert Pike letter, right? I don't know if you know who that is, but no. Albert Pike, he was a, a Confederate general from mm -hmm. Arkansas. And he's the only Confederate general, I think, that has a statue in Washington. And... Um, but he was a Freemason, a very prolific Freemason, and he wrote like what is considered the Freemason Bible. It's called uh, the Morals and Dogma, right? But there's this, there's this rumor that's been circulating for almost 200 years now. For almost 200 years, there's a rumor that's been circulating about him um, having wrote in a letter that predicted World War III, or not just World War III, but the two World Wars before that. Mm. And that's been a big thing. And I just recently sat down, being you know the, the uh, researcher that I am, and dug into it, like, is this real? It took me hours, it took me hours of digging through and, and researching and reading, only to find it was never real. There was never an Albert Pike letter predicting World War I, II, or three. It was, a, again, a, t a game of telephone. It all started with, with this dude by the name of Leo Taxil back in like the 1800s who started this rumor, but it never had to do with wars. It had to do with him and Lucifer, again, the whole Lucifer thing. And slowly over time, it progressed to this thing having to do with the three world wars. And in the truth of community, people swear by that. You know, this letter's real, this letter's real, but it's not. A lot of this stuff is not real. It's just us playing games with ourselves. And, and that's why I had to write this book about consciousness. And I didn't mean for these three books to kind of follow each other, but they kind of just did. The first book is about Lucifer, how that never existed, and how we just kind of play these games with ourselves and create archetypes, and we base our lives off, off of these archetypes. And then the second book, the Anunnaki Theorem, is about how, monothe how monotheism was formed out of the Anunnaki stories and how it was used just to control us. It's all these, like, petty things, right? But then, outside of all of that, we still exist. We're still here. There's still a beautiful life to be had. There's still a, there's still a, an earth, and so so what's up with all of that? What's what's up with life outside of these institutions that we dictate our lives through? And that's what my third book is about: is just getting outside of the institutional narratives. You know, not looking at things through a Christian mindset, a Judaic mindset, an Islamic mindset, but just as a human. You know, what is going on? What is this all about? And so when I say there are no demons, I mean that that. The, I don't believe in demons in the way the Christians think about it, because if you believe in it in the way they believe it, and then you're, you're just falling back in line with all of these these fallacies and these these different philosophies. Mm. But I do believe I do believe that the paranormal does happen. I've had experiences in the paranormal. I've had experiences in the paranormal. I've I've uh, seen some weird things. I've I've had friends tell me some crazy stories, and. Um, yeah, well, let's get into it. I'll get into that. What kind of experiences have you had, paranormal? Well, I've had a lot of experiences as a kid that I thought something was happening. But to this day, I look back and I'm like, I don't know. That was probably just my mind playing tricks on me. But I've also had experiences where even as an adult, I'm like, nah, like that actually did happen. And uh, was this I, before or after the 14 year old mushroom trip? <laughs> after. Okay. <laughs> Five minutes after, one hour after? <laughs> no, no. Um, like, for example, as a kid, like, I would just have, like, weird things, like, I, you know, hear hear noises or thought that I saw something. But I think that was just my mind playing yeah. tricks on me because I, like, really, really believed yeah. that demons were around me and shit like that, you know? Yeah. It messed with my mind. And and before we get into that, let me tell you a quick story. Well, the mind does that shit. Like, before we die, the mind, like, the pineal gland opens up and we fucking hallucinate before we die. That's what those near-death experiences are, the studies into those near-death experiences are about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was a funny moment in my life where I, when I realized in full circle that I was just tripping as a kid. Because um, I was having a I was having a conversation with my nephew who was like, I don't know, like nine or something at the time. And he was telling me um, that he was seeing clowns at night. And he didn't grow up religious. You know, um, he didn't grow up like I did. He, he didn't know the Bible or anything. He was not religious at all. Mm -hmm. So, but he was telling me like, hey, uncle, like I'm seeing clowns at night. I can hear them. They're in my closet. I'm like, you know, typical kid stuff. And I think at that time is, is when um, that whole clown thing was happening where people were dressing up as clowns like 2011 or something. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yes, I do remember that. Yeah. So I think that was messing with his, hit, with his head. And I was like listening to him. Like, oh yeah, what's going on? Tell me, you know, just playing therapist. And I'm like, look, look, listen to me. And I, and I told them, you know, I'll give them a whole thing. Like, there's no clowns in your closet. Nothing's going on. And I gave him the same Bible verse that my mom gave me when I was a kid. 
and it was uh, Psalm 27, and it's like this empowering verse about you know having confidence and or whatever. But when I was hearing him talk about this, I started laughing, like not at him, but like internally, like wow, because when I was his age, I thought I was seeing and hearing demons. But that was my trauma. That was the thing that I grew up being afraid of. So it made me realize like how powerful the mind is, how powerful the imagination mm. is. And uh, we create these things. So to get into my third book, which is uh, titled The Crystal Lattice Mind Illusion, I'd like to start with a quote from Carl Jung. Right? But before we get into that, I just want to also recap this whole Sumerian thing. The reason that's important, again, is just to understand that our entire world, the entire institutional world that we live in, the corporatocratic world that we live in, which runs off of religion, government, um, the, the entertainment business, all of these different corporatocratic industries are based off of just illusions. Mm -hmm. They're based off of illusions, narratives. And that's evident in the history, as I've briefly pointed out. Right. Through this Lucifer and Anunnaki monotheism stuff. Mm -hmm. So starting this conversation, I'd like to start with the quote that I opened up my book with, um, with from Carl Jung, the famous psychoanalyst. And I don't know the exact quote off the top of my head, but basically what he said was that archetypes are to consciousness what the crystal lattice is to the crystal. And what he's saying is that just as crystals are formulated off of these microcosmic structures, right? So is our entire reality constructed of these intricate inner symbolisms. Basically what he's saying is our entire reality is constructed off of codes. But the codes to him were, were archetypes, major and minor. For example, in tarot, when you, when you pull a tarot card, you're pulling a, an archetype. It could be the archetype of the hermit. And when you pull that card, immediately that card comes packed with all kinds of philosophies and things and this and that. But all, it's just a card, just an image. Right. And it's the same thing about reality. He stated that when we are born, our mind is, downloads the archetypes of our reality so that when we're born into this world, we know what a tree is. We know what a sun is. And Plato talked about this too in his theory of forms. Plato talked about um, the fact that everything in this life is a facsimile from the source, the original. For example, there's a sun in the sky and we can draw it, we can take a picture of it, whatever. But all those representations are facsimiles of what he called the essence, the sun. That's the only real sun there is. And he believed that all of life is like that. Everything is just a shadow bouncing off of what the mystics of old have always called source, mm. heaven. Time and time again, the mystics have talked about life being like a dream a, mm. a, a, of shadow coming from somewhere. And in my book, I talk about the mind illusion. Now, the mind illusion is the fact that we believe, for the most part, that we're just one unit. We're just a body. I'm just a person. I'm just Eddie. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. Because the body itself is made up of billions of components. If you want to count all the moving cells and all the intricacies within us. Just the body alone is made up of billions of parts. Mm -hmm. But the body is just one part of who we are. The other part is the mind. And even the mind, like the body, has compartments. We know this to be true in the conscious and subconscious. And with that spirit machine that we toggle through in this reality, we have central reality. Central reality is the narrative that is told to us through the central networks, the central institutions. And central reality, for example, would be told to us or we would be indoctrinated through um, for it or to it through uh, like the TV networks. Mm -hmm. right? The TV networks, the health industry, the entertainment industry, the education industry, the governmental industries, all of these centralized institutions that make up the globalist network are what um, dictate the central reality. So money dictates reality. That's, that's one part of it. And sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's one part of it. But what I'm saying is that there's a central reality that we all agree is true. Right. And 
But we also have our individual reality, the way that we think about ourselves or the way that we think about life. Mm. Well, how do we fit into that? Well, it's a crude system, really. And it's actually a genius system, right? Because this world is pretty big, actually. I mean, it's small, but it's it's, it's as vast, you know, for one person to to move around, right? So the the rulers that be, per se, they, in order, like, as I just mentioned, they have to find clever ways to control us. And one of the earliest ways they found was religion, Mm -hmm. right? So the central reality of Judaism is the Torah, right? The central reality of our world is the government. No matter where you're at in the world, the government is always going to be the core of what regulates everything. Right. And that's becoming more and more globalized. And religious. And religious. Politics are becoming religion. Yeah, exactly. And so we have that- Really? No, yeah. Like even like there's two religions in the U.S. right now. It's crazy. What do you mean? As in left and right, both sides of politics. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, see, exactly. So those are central realities. They're creating like these, but it's all just, again, narratives. They're just perceptions and they're based off of fallacies, illusions. Yeah, but at the same time, people, people, we are are social animals and we like to be grouped into, we like to be in our groups, right? We feel we, that's how we get security. There's this pyramid, this guy explained to me called the, um, the creation of a state. Um, and the way he explained it to me was interesting. He says, there's, there's three main levels to the pyramid. There's the first layer, which is, um, individualism, right? Where we're all out for ourselves. The second layer is tribalism where like you and me can be in a group and those people can be in a group. We're both in our own tribes. Maybe I'm a good, I'm a good um, farmer, I'm a good gardener, and maybe you're a good hunter. So I'll do the gardening and you'll do the hunting. You'll, bring, you'll share the meat with me and I'll share my vegetables with you. And we are, we're a tribe. That way, if this guy tries to come in and club my wife over the head and steal her, you'll help, you'll help me protect my, my wife, right? Above that, there's the creation of a state where you know, now these tribes become so big You have to incorporate things like taxes and everyone kind of throws into a pool to help each other, you know, to run all of the things that keep our state intact. And, you know, it's like that's how society runs. And it's like we're at the point now where we're too big for our own good. Right. This works up to a certain size, like a small tribe. It, it makes sense where you see everybody, you interact with people, you 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 each have value to each other, right? There's trade-offs. But like right now, we're so fucking enormous. It's like we have to almost faction off into these smaller tribes, you know, like, pol- like politically even. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we should. That's the way it should be. You know, it's, that's the way it used to be. You know, we used to have our, our tribes, our little corners, you know, and we were just friendly or whatever. But... Over time, specifically in during the 20th century, the institutions try to globalize everything and have that monopoly on everything, like just have that net over everything. Mm-hmm. And I, I have a documentary on my channel about the Committee of 300 that, that shows a timeline of the globalist philosophy and how that developed and how we got from, like, for example, Cecil Rhodes to Klaus Schwab, you know, how we got from there to this. And so these institutions, yeah, they're, they're trying to turn us into something that we're not naturally. You know, they're trying to turn us into this one centralized, autonomic, just governmental one world system. When, as you said, that's that's not how we are naturally. It's not how we act naturally. You know, mm-hmm. we have our family systems and this and that, our, our family morals, our realities. But they're trying to make central reality the one thing. Well, it's, it's also like, it's almost like religion is is meant for a smaller group of people. It's not meant for billions and billions of people. You know, it's almost like we're too comfortable. We're, it's it's too easy for us now with technology, the way technology has evolved, um, you know, communicating over social media through a computer, people staying at home all day, doing meetings through the screen, not interacting with people. It's It's like it's breaking down society almost. Yeah. And I don't think that the uh, interconnectivity is like an evil thing. Like it could be a beautiful thing, you know, and that's like the whole thing in the truth of community is like, no, the interconnectivity is, is the foundation of what we are. Like that's yeah. what we need to be, to, to thrive and live. 
yeah, we, we're like moving out of this Kali Yuga per se and, and back into a golden age, right? Like as they say, like the Atlantean age when everything was advanced and interconnected, like we could live on a very beautiful place where everything was was more benevolent and more efficient. But unfortunately, the people that are running the world, they just don't have that in mind, you know? Like they just they just want to produce and they want to keep us as as them versus us and stuff like that. You know, for example, like like Jeff Bezos, you know, he's got this monopoly on on the production system right now and and slowly it's going to probably become even bigger and bigger until maybe there is just one giant company that takes care of all the production Mm -hmm. you know people like him are so are so weird to me like i understand the like i understand wanting to like have this enormously successful bit maybe just because i've never been there i don't understand it but like i understand like creating amazon you know creating becoming a billionaire even but like to get more ambitious, ambitious than that, like you're a billionaire, you have more money than anybody else. Now you want to fucking, you want to monopolize the earth. Yeah. Like how do you get there? Yeah. I man. can't even fathom. I mean, that mindset. In a sense, we've always been like that too. Like all mm-hmm. history shows that there's always been Bezos and guys like Klaus Schwab's, you know, like Nimrod, um, you know, Sargon of Akkad. Like we've always been like that. Even the Sumerians, the Sumerians were a warring faction. You know, they were always warring against each other. We've always had that flaw in us. But I don't think yes. we're destined to just be that. I think we're destined to be more than that. And that's kind of a part of what I'm here to talk about. But there's something else you mentioned. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But there, there's something else that you mentioned um, that I will probably mess up when I regurgitate it to you, but maybe you can expand on it. But there was after. Um, the gods created us in their likeness. They created us as like a worker species. Can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. So even in the Bible, you know, we're told that we were basically made to till the ground. You know, we we were made to take care of the Garden of Eden. We were made to till the ground, to take care of the animals, to take care of God's creation. But, you know, we messed it up after, you know, partying with the serpent or whatever. <laughs> but uh, again, that's based on the Sumerian tales. Because in the Sumerian tales, there's at least three uh, texts that, that talk about us being created. And each of those versions were always created through an admixture of their blood and what is called clay, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, clay. And the Bible obviously reflects that with, with Adam being formed out of the clay. Mm-hmm. And so the Sumerians tell us we were created as, out of an admixture of their blood and clay, but we were specifically designed, and the texts tell us this, we were specifically designed to simply just be worshipers and workers right. of the gods they want us to build something yeah we were it just i don't know the exact word but i'm paraphrasing one of the texts says we were we were meant to basically be there to serve them like just to serve them and, and worship them and appreciate them that's pretty much it what do you, you know? think about that um i think it's pretty it's pretty wild it's kind of weird you know um and i think it's plausible for example it's plausible because for for one thing, whoever the Anunnaki were, whoever they were, they weren't human by definition. Because what a human is is what we are. Right. And even what we are, which science would say um, we are Homo sapiens sapiens, mm-hmm. which is weird. Homo sapiens sapiens are a new creation. We're like at best like 150 to 200,000 years old. Mm -hmm. in this current skeletal system and hominid form Mm -hmm. but prior to that we were a whole different thing there was a whole different thing and And you think that whatever we were the cataclysm wiped us out and we started over well what i think is okay if we were to go based off of our ancestors what i think is that the homo sapien sapien was probably at the very least um like a genetic experiment done through um selective breeding at the very least. I mean, Zechariah Sitchin, at the very, at the far of the spectrum, you have Zechariah Sitchin, an ancient alien, saying, yeah, you know, aliens designed us in a lab. Mm-hmm. But even our ancestral texts in the Sumerian texts tell us that we were created through an admixture of DNA of the gods and whatever clay was. Mm. And even in anthropology, we are told that the Homo sapiens sapien is a fairly new creation. And we haven't been around that long. So what I, if you take all that together, what I think is, yeah, we, we're pretty new. We're pretty new, and we were probably designed at the very least through a selective breeding in the same way that we do through with, with plants, in the same way we, we do with plants and even animals. Like certain dogs weren't around 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Right. 
Yeah, the the um the lab or the golden retriever. <laughs> the golden yeah. retriever was created by humans. Yeah. So yeah. it's like we are the slave species that are just here to be born, work, and die, and build yeah. and create. And that yeah. seems like what we're doing. Yeah, man. And that's pretty much all we do, right? But I don't think that's all we were meant to do. Like if you think about AI and yeah. like the evolution of AI, all we do is just compete against each other. Whether it be through companies or individuals, we compete to develop better things. Like look at the iPhone. That's a great example. Or consumer electronics. It's a great example. Samsung and Apple, they, they're competing to create more innovative, advanced technology to sell to consumers right yeah and it's just underneath that is just this labyrinth of workers whether it be legitimate slaves in china mining lithium or whatever it is and or you know the people that are sitting behind the desks creating the applications that go on these phones yeah it's like uh, there's a there's a famous quote i forget who it's from i forget where i heard it but it's always stuck in my mind is that um I think it was an AI person who said this, that we are the sex organs of the machine world. Mm, yeah, I've heard that quote, yeah. Yeah, actually, I wrote a, like an essay for, for a Subtle Body Press um, based out here in Florida, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah and it was titled uh, Technology on the Other Side, and it was just about that. Like, like we're just bees creating this hyperintelligence. That's exactly the, the metaphor I use. You know, we're like beavers, we're like bees, we're like butterflies. Like, our, it's, it's in our innate you know our nature to just create technology and we might not even know why you know we might be we don't know why but we're creating it yeah and it could be for ai it and, and the majority of it too is it's weird to think about it, but if you really distill it down it's all about sex and money oh yeah it's reproduction and and money which is goes back to fucking sex people want money so women will like them and they can fuck yeah yeah i was gonna get into that a little bit here but yeah getting back to to the consciousness thing and this kind of goes with it, right? We have the conscious and the subconscious. And as you're saying, th there's this drive that's, you know, pushing all of this and it's subconscious. The subconscious is what drives most of this. And mm. what's interesting is that the subconscious is where the program really begins. But just to, to close what I was saying about central reality, we have this central reality, right? This, this governmental globalist institution that, that tells us what is what, but that's just an illusion. It's just a program. Right. And then we have the subconscious program mm -hmm. and in the subconscious is where all of the programs individually or collectively begin. And we know this because it's difficult for us to change our lives, whether that's, you know, eating better, eating better or, or um, not doing drugs or whatever it is that you want to do that you feel bad about neglecting every day. The reason it's difficult to do those things is because you can't just do it consciously. You can't just rely on your conscious mind to say if it was that easy. We would all be living our highest selves. If it was that easy to just say, I want to do this and I'm going to never do this again, mm -hmm. then we would. But it's not right. easy because our subconscious mind is where the program really right. is. And that's what Freud was all about, right? He started talking about subconscious mind. And then his bro, what was his, uh, Ed, who was Edward Bernays? I think it was his cousin. Nephew. Who, his nephew, right. That was a fascinating documentary from, uh, what was the guy's name? The BBC guy who did that documentary, Adam Curtis all about Edward Bernays and his, and, uh, and, um, Freud. And oh, yeah. he, he did this, he created this, um, he worked for, I think one of the biggest, he created the advertising agency. He created yeah. advertising in America, right? Consumerism. And he was doing these, uh, these focus groups for, I think it was Betty Crocker. I, I'm, I don't remember, Betty Crocker maybe. And he was doing focus groups because these cake mixes weren't, they weren't selling, right? They were selling these like boxed little instant cake mixes. And, they did a study group with these housewives and they were, he was studying their mind and asking them things and they were feeling inadequate at home because they didn't feel like they were contributing enough. They did. They felt worthless when they were doing, creating these, this cake because they didn't like, it's not like they didn't create it. Right. Mm, yeah, they felt yeah. like they didn't, they didn't contribute enough to it. So what Bernays thought of, for Betty Crocker was, we'll just say on the instructions, you gotta add an egg. So now they feel like they're making this thing and yeah. they, they felt more fulfilled as housewives. Yeah, it's such a weird thing about the subconscious mind, <laughs> yeah, how kinda, it works and how it sells. And it all goes back to consumerism and, and money. 
Yeah, it sucks how simple we are. Yeah, you know. And even have you ever seen the show Westworld on HBO? I haven't, but I know about it. Yeah. There's a great quote in that movie too, um, where he's he's talking to uh, the guy who creates Westworld. He's talking to one of the ladies that worked for him, and he talks about um, human consciousness. And he he says, "Look at the Eiffel Tower, look at the Mona Lisa, look at Mozart, and th it's j all it is is peacock feathers." The human consciousness is just an elaborate mating call. All these cr brilliant creations throughout humanity. That's all it is. Peacock feathers. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. That's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, and I get into that into the book too. It's like we have these different facets. And, and as the ancient texts tell us, like we were designed to just be these simple art biological AIs who are just here to eat, sleep, and fuck, you know. Um, but I do believe that we can be more than that. And I'll get into that. I think that whatever created us, like the grand creator, had it in its mission for us to eventually evolve and upgrade. Now, we weren't always meant to just be these little things, but it's the rulers of, the, of this world, the controllers of this world that want us to stay in that role of simply just reincarnating through samsara just to be these little, you know, biological automatons. Mm -hmm. But we're meant to be so much more than that. And the universe and nature tells us that. Let me give you an example. So, uh, so we have the mind illusion part of all of this, right? Again, so we're we're not just a body; we're obviously a mind as well. But both of those compartments have their own facets too, which are complex. But apart from the mind illusion, we have the crystal lattice part of this. Yeah, what is crystal lattice? So, a crystal lattice in physics is basically just the um, most minute three-dimensional unit that makes up a crystal okay so it could look like a cube or like a tetrahedron or something but it's just it's an actual like minute formation of particles the most minute unit okay right and that's what Jung was saying in that in that quote that i that i said earlier about reality is that all of real all of reality the physical reality and the mental reality is made up of lattices as well so it's all a simulation in that sense so the crystal lattice part of this physical world is the fact that even nature is built off of these micro uh, cosmic structures that are systematic and geometric. For example, we have the Fibonacci sequence, right? And the Fibonacci sequence was, was uh, founded or, or presented by um, Leonardo Fibonacci in his book, Liber Abacus. And basically he just came up with this like cool, fun equation. And through that fun equation, he, he founded the Fibonacci sequence, which is a sequence of numbers that are the sum of the two previous numbers. But what scientists found later is that when you input those numbers or that sequence into nature, we find that all of these natural growth patterns that are around us run off of this system. And they run off of codes, very specific codes. And, and, and so nature around us may look like it's flowy or it's random or it's chaotic, but when we really study nature and how it grows from seed to full form, mm -hmm. it, it's all growing off of a system of codes, a system of very set rigid codes. And th that's you know, evident in the Fibonacci sequence, but it's also evident in the golden ratio. And the golden ratio, which is 1.618, is the ratio that all of the Fibonacci sequence numbers harmonize to. And when we input the golden ratio again into like nature or whatever, we find again that that equation, that, that those numbers, that set of numbers and equation is all around us. It's in our face. It's in our body. So the human body, as weird and oblong as it may seem for the most part, is actually carefully designed um, through these, these code systems. So the moment a woman gets pregnant, from conception to being birth, the human baby is being formed through a system of codes and geometries. And the example of that would not just be the Fibonacci sequence and those numbers, but also the fact that when we become an egg, we're like this little circular egg thing. And then the circular egg duplicates and duplicates. And that's geometry. Those are sacred, those are sacred geometric uh, symbols. Mm. For example, the flower of life um, is actually a symbol of that of the symbol of the egg duplicating into all these other little circles. And the fact that it takes a baby exactly nine months, give or take, to be born is another example of how all of life is based off of systematic numerical codes and geometry. 
The codes would be the equations and the numbers and the dates that it takes for things to form. The geometry would be the abstract final form of what these equations are. Example again, you Can know. you find like a diagram of this Fibonacci sequence? I, th I feel like that would be a good thing yeah. to look at while you're talking about this because this is hard to wrap my head around. Yeah, so originally he started off by talking about rabbits mating. So that is, this is the Fibonacci spiral. So if you input the Fibonacci numbers or the sequence into nature, it's going to create that spiral uh, growth pattern. Mm. So if you that first one on the left, yeah, yeah. So so if you input the numbers, the sequence into nature, it'll create this growth pattern, this fractal growth pattern that we see in a human fetus. A human fetus starts off in that form, you know, curled up in a fetus fetal okay. form. Um, galaxies, for example, galaxies follow this sequence. Um, wind patterns, everything. It's it's almost everywhere. Right. But he started this. Yeah, off that's what a hurricane right? looks like from above. Yeah. Yeah, if you go a little bit down, um, you see that pyramid right there? Yeah, so that's like a, an actual representation of the sequence. So it's every number is, is the summation of the two numbers before. Every number is a summation of the two numbers before. Okay, got it. Right. Wow. Yeah, and so that is the So lattice. who came up with this? Uh, Leonardo Fibonacci. Oh, Leonardo, you said that. Yeah, in his book, Liber Abacus. Hmm. Yeah, so this this is the lattice that is in nature, right? So you look at a tree, and it just looks like a flowing tree. It's all chaotic. It's got branches going everywhere. But it's actually beautifully designed that way through a code system. And so all of life around us is built off of code systems. This is apparent in technology, too. We ourselves encode things. You know, we, we know how to do that ourselves. You know, a, a laptop, a, cr a computer, this microphone, it's all built up of smaller components. And then the right. more and more you go into it, you just find that it's particles, lattices of particles creating this stuff. Mm. So that's in part the crystal lattice mind illusion, the fact that we are more than our body, we are also a mind, and that all physical reality is comprised of these lattices, these codes that create it. And we are also pieces of a bigger piece, right? We're also yeah. little particle lattices, or what is the word again? Yeah, lattice. We're, we're lattice to something bigger than us. Exactly. And I yeah. wonder, what is that? Yeah, that's the big question, and, and we can get into that later. But before we do, I want to talk about DNA for a little bit. So uh, um, there's a new, or not a recently new theory about DNA. For the most part, people thought that DNA was what... Um, created genes, that DNAs were the cause of genes. But uh, Rupert Sheldrake, um, if you want to pull him up, um, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, he talked about what are known as morphogenetic fields. And morphogenetic fields is a new theory for how uh, DNA and cells are formed. He simply it stated popped up, the suggestion popped up when you clicked on his clicked on his name in the search, and, and uh, it, you know how like it suggests things. Yeah, morphogenetic fields down there. Yeah. So he, he simply looked at a cell and said, DNA can't be the constructor of a cell because DNA comes as a part of the package of a cell. See what I'm saying? It's like the DNA is already a part of the cell. DNA simply decides what traits the cell is going to give off. So okay. He, so he, he, he theorized that there's a whole other force or, or field that is actually creating cells, and he called that the morphogenetic field. There's an invisible field, an invisible field that actually resonates cells into existence. It's kind of weird, but if you were to imagine, if we were to like, you know, go into the microscopic world, into the world of cells, cells more or less sort of just resonate into appearance from somewhere. <laughs> and that's what he called the morphogenetic field. And I want to start with that um, because it's not far-fetched because even all, everything around us already operates in that way. In physics, we have what are known as the four fundamental forces. The electromagnetic force, which is invisible, but we know it exists, right? You can get a magnet and you can see it push things around. Right. That, that's one force. And then we have the, the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is, is, uh, is what holds things together. It's what holds atoms in place. And then we have the weak nuclear force, which is what causes things to decay, so it causes emissions. It's what causes combustion in the universe. And then we have the fourth, which is the gravitational force. This one is still theoretical. Einstein is the one who kind of like, 
came up with this. But gravity, we can't measure gravity yet. We can only measure it through its effects on other things. We know it's there, but we don't. We can't see it even with our apparatuses yet. Mm-hmm. And what gravity does, it sets everything into motion. It's all it, about mass. It's in the mass, but what it, what it does, it sets everything into motion. It's what actually sets the clockwork into motion. So the three forces were probably created first, right? After physicality was formed from whoever or whatever, and then gravity was the last thing. It was like, all right, well, let's let's start it. Let's 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 uh, let's get it going. You know, let's uh, press the start button, right? Because it's it's the clockwork force. It's right. what makes everything start moving. Right. And gravity and time are very intertwined. Yeah, exactly. But science scientists have been looking for the fifth force for many many decades, and so the fifth force is this is this theory um, theoretical force that scientists think interlinks all forces and it expands all across the universe and into everything whether it's a particle or a planet Mm. and some scientists think that they have found it gravitational time dilation occurs because objects with a lot of mass create a strong gravitational field the gravitational field is really curving is really a curving of space and time the stronger the gravity the more space time curves and the slower time itself proceeds Mm. So the stronger the gravity, the faster time moves. That yeah, there you go. Yeah, man. And and I am not a scientist, man. I that's to... why that's why in the movie Interstellar, when they go to that other star, they go to that other um that planet on that other star. There's like very little gravity there, and that's why time when he comes back, he's the same age, and his daughter's like ninety years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's wild, huh? But uh, yeah, I'm no scientist, man. Like I, I, I just love researching and reading and stuff. So I had to read so many thick like pieces of material to like just barely wrap my head around some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. But I started to see the full picture, right? I started to understand what's really going on here, you know. Um, so yeah, this fifth force, scientists have been trying to find that. It's also known as the unified field. And we, th- some people think they've found it. Like for example, in 2022, we found a new particle called the X17 particle. And they think, oh, that might be the fifth force that's, that's actually like interconnecting everything. But we've still yet to find it. But what's interesting is, is when we read all the ancient texts, we kind of get an idea how all of this began. Right. What we know for sure is that we're here. Right. We're here. Things are physical or whatever. We're here. But how did we get here? Who created us? If we go and read all the ancient texts, we find three key similarities. Whether we're reading the Enuma Elish, the Egyptian creation text, um, or or the Rig Veda by the Hindus, they all say that it all began in a watery darkness. There was some kind of watery darkness, and then from the watery darkness sprang forth the first mind, the first consciousness, and it was a self-created androgynous mind. And then that mind then created the physical world. But it created the physical world through sound, through resonance. For example, in the Torah, God said, let there be light. And in the Nasadiya Sukta, in the Rig Veda, we're told that this God basically spoke life into existence. In the Enuma Elish, we're told that nothing had yet been named. Right? And in the Egyptian text, we're told that Atum, the first created consciousness, spoke life into existence. So this idea of word... Uh, bringing life into existence is important because all word is is just vibration coupled with with meaning so we started off in this etheric field of watery darkness a force field Mm -hmm. and then the first mind and that first mind then created everything through uh uh, the imagination and 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 word so whoever the creator is is so powerful that it can create through just thinking and stating and we have a microcosmic um, attribute of that. We have imaginations. We can think things, and we can create the things we think. So we're a reflection of our own creator. We have that power mm-hmm. to think and create. What is the story about the Atlanteans? Uh, so that one, again, it's one of these telephone things. Okay. So Atlantis was told to us through uh, Plato. Right. Plato. So in what is known as his Timaeus and Critias texts. Mm-hmm. And we learned through Plato's text that 
um, his uncle or some some Greek by the name of Solon. Solon, right, God of the Sun. Yeah, Solon heard it through an Egyptian priest. Mm-hmm. But the moral of the story, people think that the story has to do with like this this big like you know like city or whatever that had flying cars and golden buildings or whatever. You know, people think that Atlantis has to do with this lost golden age. But the moral of the story, if you actually go and read Critias and Timaeus is that this Egyptian priest was telling Solon that the Greeks are, are infants in history, that they don't even know the vastness of their own people. And this Egyptian priest tells Solon a story that they don't know. And the story is about this island nation, the Atlanteans, who right. used to be benevolent. They were like benevolent, high moral, but got too rich and, and, and snooty and, and kind of like... Um, you know, destroyed it all and decided to to venture out to the neighboring kingdoms to go subjugate them and kill them. But um, it was a band of of ancient Greeks who actually drove them back to Atlantis and fought them off and saved all the neighboring countries. But those those warrior Greeks unfortunately fell with Atlantis at, when after it sank. Mm. And so what the the Egyptian priest was saying, the moral of the story was, you Greeks are arrogant in thinking that you're some high civilization. You're an infant compared to my people. And you don't even know the history of your own warriors who fought back against the Atlanteans. That was the moral of the story. Basically, it was just don't be arrogant in in thinking that you know everything and that your civilization is the greatest when you haven't even studied your own history, let alone the history of those around you. Mm, Don't fly too close to the sun. Yeah. Have you seen the uh have you seen like the videos of people talking about uh like where Atlantis is, like the Eye of Africa? Yeah. The guy Jimmy Corsetti talks about it a lot and he like shows the evidence that that was Atlantis. Yeah, that's that's cool stuff. I mean, I did a little video on Lemuria, which is always coupled with Atlantis. And Lemuria again a telephone thing like you know, if you go into the spiritual truth of community, they're always like, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a reincarnated Lemurian or whatever, you know. But Lemuria was, was uh, um, hypothesized by a zoologist in like the 1800s who realized that there were f- similar lemur bones off the coast of Madagascar in India. So he, he you know, postulated that there might have been a land bridge at some point in right. the Indian Ocean. And he called it lemur or lem- Lemuria because of the lemur bones. So it's like, I just thought that was funny. Like, you got all these people calling themselves Lemurians, but it was all just named after lemurs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's just, it's just fascinating stuff. People like exaggerate it, like they like to get all into it and all that stuff. Fanatical, you know? Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's why it's so interesting to me how, you know, all these ancient stories and stuff tie back to cataclysms. It's so yeah. fascinating to me. Yeah, man. Yeah. And that, that's the real, that really happened, you know? This earth has shifted many times. You know, if you want to believe in plate tectonics or whatever, like the formation of the countries right now is, is fairly new. There used to be a Pangea. There right. probably were several Pangeas. And there probably will be another one at some point. What is this? The land bridge? That's wild. So this thing follows all the way. That, that, where they, that picture, that little map they show, that's what they predict it will look like. Dude, that's insane. That's wild, yeah. Yeah, I see people, you know, a thousand years from now will be like, oh, yeah. Oh, that one. Click on the one at the bottom right. Like, I'm a ancient reincarnated Ethiopian or whatever, because mm. it'll be under the ocean. What is the, there's like a t- statistic of like the number of species that we still haven't discovered that are under the ocean. Oh, I don't even want to know, dude. The ocean freaks me out. <laughs> You know, and then if like back in the day, they would, you know, <laughs> they think in the times of antiquity, they thought that there were sea monsters. Now we have names for them because we study them. We were more advanced, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And that's kind of what I do too, man. It's like is study these quote unquote archetypal monsters or things that we fear, you know, like Lucifer and stuff like that. It's like the more you just really study things unbiasedly, mm-hmm. the more you can, we can mature as a whole people. You know, yeah. That's that's my goal with this, man. It's just it's just to like look at things maturely. Like, what's really going on? What's the real history? You know, what's the real definition, so that we can move forward. I want to bring up uh, Alfred Wallace. Okay. So Alfred, a lot of people know Darwin, for example, right? Everybody knows Darwin, Darwinism, mm-hmm. theory of evolution, but very rarely do you come across somebody who knows Alfred Wallace. And Alfred Wallace was actually the co-founder of the theory of uh, natural selection. And basically Darwinism. Okay. He was, he was friends with Darwin. He helped Darwin create this theory. But Alfred Wallace later renounced his belief on evolution 
when it comes to the mind. He realized that there's, the evolution does not explain how the human mind came into existence. It's way too complex and it's way too abstract to, to have been a necessity for just some like, you know, hominid, you know, like the fact that we can imagine things and create them and create languages and, and, and symbols and all this stuff. That stuff, that's not useful for somebody who just needs to hunt and fuck, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and he was going to seance parties too. He was kind of a trip, dude. He was going to like seance parties and was witnessing the most weird shit. What's a seance party? So these were big in like the late 1800s where people would come and like they'd basically try to summon spirits and like oh, demons and shit. And damn. Yeah, like like Ouija board stuff like that. So he was going to these seance parties and, and he was seeing like tables levitate, like people talking in tongues and like actual phantoms. So why what, what, what made him decide that we're not a part of evolution? Well, after going to these seance parties and just kind of like you know analyzing the human mind a little more he just concluded for himself that evolution doesn't explain the human mind you know how it developed because evolution only explains how like rudimentary necessary things in nature evolve adaptations but the human mind is not necessary you know like it's not necessary to just eat sleep and reproduce in the in the complexity that we have it today and the thing is too is uh even anthropologists today state that the current consciousness that we have is, is new, you know, according to how we analyze mm. art and everything, like it's only about 50,000 years old. Prior to about 50,000 years ago, we didn't have consciousness in the way that we have it today. So it's almost like something upgraded it. And that's kind of what I'm saying. It's like, yeah, we might've started off as like these slaves for the Anunnaki or whatever, these Neanderthals, but something caused an upgrade. And Terence McKenna would say that that upgrade was was mushrooms through the stoned ape theory. The stoned ape theory, yes. Explain the stoned ape theory for people who don't know what it is. So the stoned ape theory, um, you know, proposed by Terence McKenna, is that at some point in our caveman history, we started following around certain animals who were pooping, and and through their poop, uh, mushrooms were growing. And as we followed them around, we started you know getting curious and started eating the mushrooms and after we had these like very potent psychedelic trips we started to formulate language you know we started to speak and we started to see things in a new way and mm-hmm. and the mushrooms helped us create abstract thinking and apart from the stone ape theory um oh and also in that theory terence mckenna states that um our brains doubled in size our brains doubled in size which caused a consciousness um, upgrade but even in anthropology, just mainstream anthropology, we are told that our pre-Homo sapiens sapien ancestors were non-linguistic hominids. What separates us from our ancestors, from our caveman ancestors, if you will, is that we are linguistic, symbological hominids. Mm-hmm. We create languages, we create symbols, we, we have abstract thinking, and we don't really know why. That There was no need for that, per se. Maybe there was. One of the theories for it is though is that it actually helped us create a better memory system. That the way we have consciousness today actually helped create a better a better memory system. That that's all the only reason why we developed that way so that we could remember things. Like for example, like don't go into that forest. There's cheetahs in there, so we create a symbol for that. Like cheetahs in here, beware. Mm-hmm. You know, so it like just created we created it a survival as for survival. So there there is that theory too. But all in all, Alfred Wallace, you know, the co-founder of Darwinism and the theory of evolution, concluded for himself that the evolution does not explain the human consciousness experience. Mm. It's too complex. Something else must have created it. And um, the mainstream theories for consciousness uh, basically state that we're just a computer. You know, there's four main theories. Uh, I don't have them in front of me right now, but the four main theories basically state that all of the working components in our brain work in conjunction to create the false illusion that we're conscious. The fact that we're constantly sensing things and that we're constantly experiencing things, that culmination of all those experiences, for example, I'm sitting in this chair, I'm smelling things, I'm hearing things, all of those come together and create this like three-dimensional illusion that I'm conscious. But it's just really me just sensing all those things at once. Okay. That's the mainstream theory. We're just a computer. We're just computing things. And because we're computing at such a complex and fast level, mm-hmm. it creates this simulation of consciousness. Hey, I'm a person. I'm thinking. I'm doing things. Mm. But we know that's not true inherently. We know that's not true. 
You know, because we have abstract thinking, we have what is called the self. Right. This individuation. Mm. Because if that's all we had, we wouldn't have a self. There would be no reason for a self or abstract artist, artistic thinking. We would just be like animals or bugs right. who have autonomic thinking. Mm. Not to say that they're not conscious. I think they are, but I think that they have a, a different form of consciousness. There are different levels of consciousness. And this is taught to us through the mystics in like the theory of reincarnation or the belief of reincarnation, I should say. Right. Um, I read a book, which is where I where I gained my uh, knowledge on reincarnation. And it was written by A.C. Bhaktivedanta, a very uh, prolific Swami. And he states that reincarnation isn't a good thing. You know, a lot of people think that reincarnation is like this, like cool, like belief system. Like, yes, I'm going to reincarnate one day. But if you if you listen to the actual yogis and gurus and stuff, it's not a good thing. You don't want to be stuck in samsara. It's a bad thing to, to continually come back. Why? Well, because the goal of the human being, the goal of the human soul is to elevate out of this, to go to the next step. If you can believe it or not, there's actually another level of conscious living. Oh, uh, okay. And so there's different kingdoms of consciousness, he says. There's the plant consciousness, the animal consciousness, and the human consciousness. Mm. And you can read yeah, isn't it. There, isn't there evidence now that plants are conscious? Oh, yeah, they are. Actually, we, there was a study last year, I think, that came out that um, yeah. mushrooms, for example, certain mushrooms have a language right they yes. speak up to like 50 words that's insane man yeah so everything's fascinating and it, it does have consciousness but it's different levels of consciousness mm. and reincarnation teaches us that we have the uh privilege of having the highest form of consciousness on this kingdom on of this earth. earth but there is higher consciousness and all that means is when you gain a higher consciousness all that means is that your awareness expands for example, um, you know, if you were to feel heat coming from over here, right, your consciousness now expands. You're like, oh, there's something over here. Mm. And right now, we, we, don't, we can't perceive what happens to us after death. We can't perceive that, what happens after death, because mm -hmm. our consciousness isn't expanded that, to that point. And, it's, it, and I can explain that in another metaphor. For example, if there was a door right here and we didn't know what was behind that door, we would just sit here and wonder and wonder what's behind that door. And we would just run wild. Is it heaven? Is it samsara? Is it this? Is it that? But if we were to go through, past that door and then see what's behind there, and, oh, cool, it's a nice chill couch and there's beautiful people here. It's all good. Suddenly our conscious consciousness expands. Our conscious awareness expands. Now we know what's over there. Mm. So right now we're in an illusion, in a game, in a program where we're limited to only know and understand what is here. But I think it's in our creator's plan to expand our consciousness to a point where we will be able to see more than we can see now, hear more than we can hear now, feel more than we can feel now, and, and know more than we can know now. I think that's in, in its plan for us. And that's evident through all the evolutionary stages we've already gone through. So what is that higher consciousness? Like, what do you think happens after we die? Well, um, as I was explaining earlier in the beginning, according to the ancient text, there were three main components the cosmic ether that watery darkness the creator consciousness that first consciousness that first mind the cosmic ether that watery darkness you know is that like what you think is that like the idea that when we die it's just black we just everything just goes away and it's just black nothing kind of sort of i'll get into that I that's think scary that, well, that's I think, the scariest thing okay for me yeah 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 that is kind of freaky yeah but um, it's also kind of peaceful because, I mean, I guess you won't really feel it, you know? Like, the, the way I cope with that is, like, I don't remember not being alive, so, like, it's, it's all good, you know? Yeah, but isn't that fucking, isn't that sad to yeah. think about just, like, you just evaporate, you no longer, I guess the scariest part is if your memory mm. fades to nothing, if your me the memory of yourself fades to black. Like, if your body, if you die and your body dies, that's one thing. That's fucking frightening right just to think that there's nothing after this yeah but like at least we have our legacy and our memory that we know will outlive us well the good thing is i'm here to give you some scientific evidence that our memory might actually Ooh, last scientific evidence i love scientific <laughs> evidence yeah so um well getting back to the darkness i think that darkness that you just spoke of that spooky that fearfulness i think that's an illusion too that I'll get into. And I think this this whole entrapped 
uh, simulation we're in is meant to keep us coming back and to just stop at that darkness to return back to here. And I'll explain that. But um, real quick, again, in the beginning, right, there was that watery darkness, which I called the cosmic ether. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the mother, the mother of all wave channels, right? Like the ocean is a representation of her. Um, radio waves is a representation of her. Air is a rep representation of her. The breath that we breathe is a representation of her. Whatever she is, however that looks like, our ancestors understood that in the beginning there was just this watery darkness and ether. It all started with the ether, which is what we would also call the spirit. And then there, were, there came the consciousness, the creator consciousness, who we can call God, the monad, the one. And then after that, together, they created physical life through the spoken word. And a spoken word is just vibration. And science teaches us, quantum physics teaches us that all particles are vibrating and that mm. the vibration of particles is what makes physical reality. This table right here is comprised, comprises of a lattice of particles that are vibrating right now. So all, our ancestors understood that this is the series of how life was created, how everything was created. And it's all reenacted all around us every day hmm. and in our birth it's reenacted we are inside the water right we, we are given a mind we come out we come out yelling we come out greeted we come out with our voice right it's all reenacted in all these different ways all these three elements is what i call the ancient matrix those three components make up everything and they're just re-represent re or they're represented in, in fanciful expressions all around us just that watery darkness the mind and physicality through vibration yeah and so as i was explaining with the four fundamental forces and the four fundamental forces again are just the cosmic ether through different expressions electromagnetic force the strong mm. and weak forces the gravitational force those are children of the cosmic ether the grandmother their first one Right, this and consciousness is the children of, of the first consciousness. Right? We are given we are just fragments of both of those. And so scientists have been trying to find what this underlying force, this fifth force, or even trying to find the gravitational force that intercollect interconnects everything. They've been trying to find that for decades. And two scientists, for example, uh, Vernon Nepp and Ed Close came up with a theory. I have it here, it's it's a weird theory name. Um by the name of the Triadic Dimensional Vortical Paradigm Theory. <laughs> it came up with this in 2011, and these guys are, are well vetted, you know, a bunch of publications, real scientists have been around many, many days. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this theory, they, they realize that the current model of physics can't explain our world. It can't explain our world because when we start to look at things at the quantum level, there are anomalies that the, the, the model, the current model can't explain. When you look at things at the microscopic level, at the particle level, they start to break the laws of physics. So how can the things that make up the physical world break the laws of physics? Mm -hmm. It's an illusion, right? It's an illusion. And so they came up with this theory and realized that we live in nine dimensions. They think that we live in nine dimensions, but those nine dimensions are inside of an infinite dimension. So the, the the this is what Billy Carson was telling talking about the the nine dimensions. Yeah, so these guys are the ones who came up with it, Vernon Nepp and uh, Ed Close. Okay. Yeah, old dudes, you know, been doing this for decades and um you know, again, I'm not a scientist, like I had to reread like a few of their papers to like even begin to understand why this makes sense. But what they realized that the, is that the modern model of physics can't explain quantum physics. It can't explain how things work at the particle level. So something else needs needs to, to a different model needs to be con constructed to explain this. And what they realized is that there was at least, I think, like 48 anomalies that the current model cannot explain. And one of those, one of those, the only one that I could really wrap my head around was the Kabibo angle. Uh, I don't know if you want to look that up. What is the Kabibo angle? So the Kabibo angle, uh, from what I understand, is it, this weird anomaly having to do with particles. So when we look at particles, they bounce in a certain way. And when they, when they bounce in this, in this angle, they disappear for a second, like a, a, like a fraction of a second. So they're like phasing in and out of reality, from what I understand. And so this is one of the anomalies that, you know, Vernon Nepp and Ed Close were looking at. Well, like this, this angle 
it can't be explained with modern physics. So they looked at everything, they, they redid the entire model and came up with their super long named model and realized that we lived in nine dimensions. For whatever reason, that, that was their conclusion. Um, but what's interesting about their theory is that they came up with uh, another aspect of it stating that in these nine dimensions, there exists a field that they called the gimel. And the gimel, <laughs> I don't know why they called it that, but the gimel is this fifth force that interconnects all the dimensions and extends outward to the infinite dimension, the infinite plane. And the, the gimel is how all things are interconnected. It's like the cosmic internet that allows everything to exist. It sustains everything, right? And this goes back to the ancient matrix with the, uh, the watery darkness, the cosmic creation, and the vibration. You know, there are those three elements exist inside of everything, and they stretch across everything, and they sustain everything. And so these two scientists realized that there is an internet inter interspersed in, in throughout all these dimensions that they called the gimel. And that's important because um, this goes against materialist science, you know, Einsteinian science. Mm -hmm. Einsteinian science states that all this is just physical. This is just a table. I'm just a body. I have a brain. Right. My brain makes up my mind. But scientists like them and, and other scientists are starting to realize that it's actually actually the other way around, that it's, it's consciousness that is creating all of this. So that fifth force, that underlying force that we've been looking for is consciousness itself. That's what we're starting to realize. There's a vast internet of an etheric consciousness that we all tap into. And it's that internet of consciousness that allows us to toggle into this reality. So basically what I'm saying, what I've been saying is, is this reality here, right here, is, is a simulation. This isn't really what we are. We're simply experiencing this from wherever it is we actually are. And we, can, we know this, for example, because our brain isn't real either. Science tells us this. Because science tells us that all physical objects, the entire physical world is made up of lattices that are resonating and phasing in and out. So they're holographic. So if all physical objects are phasing in and out and are holographic, then our brain, which is also a physical object, is also doing the same thing. So our brain is simply the physical representation in this simulation of, of what we are. It's what we designed to be the avatar to represent the complexity of what we really are. That's what we're starting to realize. Mm. And with that, Again, we have the conscious and subconscious mind. And again, in the subconscious mind is where the program resides. And there's a new theory about consciousness that was uh, proposed last year in 2022, primarily by a, a guy named Andrew Budson, a scientist. And Andrew Budson realized that all of life is basically deja vu. That, for example, if I were to move my arm over here, my subconscious mind told myself to do that like a split second before. But when I actually do it, I'm simply experiencing the deja vu of it. That's, that's his theory on, 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 on life, is that huh. everything we do is, is being reenacted or enacted out like a split second after our subconscious mind actually tells us to do it. Right. So what that is saying, what that tells us is that our subconscious mind is the real driver of all this. But where is it? Where does it reside? It doesn't reside in our brain. That's what Alfred Wallace was trying to tell us, the co-founder of Darwinism. Our mind, the brain doesn't produce the mind. That's what he was saying is, is evolution didn't create the mind. The mind came into the body at some point. Right. Mm. We've been around for millions of years. But for some reason, about 150,000 years ago, the Homo sapiens sapiens was created. And about 50,000 years ago, the current style of consciousness that we have, the abstract style that we have, was, was right. upgraded. So it was integrated into us. Have you ever heard of Dr. Andrew Gallimore? No. He's in Hong Kong. He's, uh, he's been studying the um, induced effects of DMT, long-sustained effects of DMT. So 
I don't know if you've ever done DMT. I haven't, but there's um, apparently there's this like, there's a different dimension that you see when you're on DMT where like people have similar experiences, right? There's been a, a vast amount of people who've done DMT that recount seeing like little elf creatures, like shapes, lots of different geometric shapes. And um, what he's, what they're trying to do scientifically is keep people because DMT, when you do it, however you take it, whether you smoke it or whatever, um, it only lasts for maybe like 10 to 20 minutes, right? It's very short. So he, what he's trying to do is keep people in that state for a long period of time so they can study what's going on there. Yeah. Which is fucking fascinating to me. Yeah. And, this, and this, what is that? What is that state? You know, it's all in your mind. It's doing something chemically to your mind where you basically enter another dimension. Yeah. So if we understand, right, that we aren't our body, right? We are simply experiencing the simulation through the body, then it all starts to make sense. Um, yeah. The body is our, it's our lens to seeing whatever this is. It's constructed inside of our brain. Yeah. So getting, And it's different for everybody. Like people like vision. Vision is very mm -hmm. different for different people. Like how do you know when you're looking at me that, I'm, that you're seeing the same thing? Yeah. Like how, we could be seeing completely different things, but how would we know? Yeah. There's no way we would know. Like we describe, we have the same words. Like we had, we use our language to describe things and people like we reference that. Like I see that mic arm, whatever. Yeah. It's this black plastic mic microphone arm that's holding your mic, but that's how my words describe what I'm seeing. But we have no way of knowing really what we're each experiencing individually. Yeah. Yeah. And words create reality getting back mm -hmm. to the central reality real quick you brought up money before you said money is like the central reality it's what dictates everything um it is yeah yeah and i brought that up in my book because money is just it's a it's an institution it's it's a concept it doesn't actually exist mm. we created it right you know everything that we need to survive on this planet grows out of the ground the food that we need grows out of the ground it runs around it's free you know, we constructed this central reality of money as a way to, whatever, just run our lives, you know, but we could run it off to so many other different systems. So, mm. and money is just a language. Money is a language comprised of terminology, right? Dollars, banks, transactions. It's a language with its own terms and its own symbols. The dollar, the paper is just a symbol. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just, uh, it's a reality. It's a reality tunnel, a central reality. And so... We create reality through language. And that's what anthropologists say, or anthropologists say that our consciousness upgraded when we started speaking in metaphor. Mm. Once we started speaking in metaphor and having abstract thinking, that's when it all kind of like doubled for us. Yeah, but the concept of money has, is even evident in primates. Yeah. Like we just have a proxy for money, like these dollars and different yen and different, you know, monetary, uh, these different types of money. But, you know, the concept of it is is clearly evident in apes. There's been studies where, like, they've found the prostitution is real in monkeys, right? Well, let me ask you this, man. Do we want to be like monkeys? Prostitution, evidence of prostitution of primates. Researchers observed chimpanzees in the Thai National Park, T-A-I National Park. I don't know how you say that. Tay, Thai? And concluded that a form of prostitution exists among chimpanzees in which females, oh, okay, the females offer sex to the males in exchange for meat, right? Smart monkeys. And it's the same way that human beings are, you know, it's the, it's the exact same thing. Females are attracted to males, not just for physical features, but for being able to provide security and create a family and to raise kids. Hey man, they got the, the uh, right. only bananas. Yeah, yeah, only <laughs> bananas, right. Shit, man, yeah. Well, that's what I'm getting at, man, is like, do we want to be like apes, right? No, we want to evolve. We want to get better. Yeah, we want to get better. And um, so right now, we're starting to realize that we're more than this body. You know, we're more than just Anunnaki slaves, right? And that's evident in quantum physics. And it's evident all around us. And to sidetrack from consciousness real quick, let's just talk about the energy, the energy grid around us that I think we are meant to tap into, 
right? So right now there's this whole craze going on with UFOs. Mm-hmm. We're seeing them all over the news, which is wild. I never thought I'd see the day where UFOs were normal on national TV, right? And we're being told that these Tic Tac UFOs or whatever are defying the laws of gravity. Whatever they are, it, whether they're man-made or not, they're defying the laws of gravity. How are they doing that? Well, anti-gravity technology has been experimented on since the 50s. This guy doesn't know what he's getting into, does he, Jordan? <laughs> uh, oh, shit. We just did a fucking four-hour episode with the physicist talking about this stuff the other really? day. Oh, yeah. Blew my fucking mind. Hell, yeah. What was he saying? It's like real or like what? Like anti-gravity? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's been being studied for a long time. He has lots of different theories, but it really took my fucking head for a whirlwind. But he's talking about light propulsion, too. So it's shit. like he's really going deep on this stuff but but there's like levels and levels of psyops and government cover-ups and you know dark research that's going on mm. but anyways sorry to interrupt no no you're good well that's that's fucking dope i can't wait to watch that <sighs> but yeah i mean as you already know this this studies studies on anti-gravity have been going on since the 50s mm. and primarily they started with um george s trimble who mm. was the head of uh, the research institute for advanced study and he put together a research team back in the 50s, um, some of the top scientists in the country to study this stuff. talking about ARPA? Oh, uh, DARPA? Yeah. Well, it was no. first ARPA. They changed it to DARPA later. No, this is Rias. Okay. Rias. Okay. But, but uh, anyway, so George S. Trimble with Rias and that whole group eventually became Lockheed Martin and mm-hmm. Skunk Works, mm-hmm. which is like these people at the head of all the stuff right now. And one of the former heads of uh, Skunk Works or Lockheed, Ben Rich, he was the guy who said that, you know, we now have the technology to take E.T. back home. And he, also, and he was asked, well, how does this technology work? How does anti-gravity technology work? And he kind of just slyly said, well, do you know how ESP works? And the interviewer said, all points in the universe are connected. He said, exactly. So this is kind of what I've been trying to build up to is like, Everything in this physical world, in this material world, is connected through lattices, smaller lattices that fractal out into a larger lattice, and they're all interconnected through an internet of force, Mm -hmm. a force field. And if we tap into that force field, then amazing things can happen. It would be like driving a boat through the ocean that runs off water. It it could just run forever Mm. because it would just be tapping into the water that it's using. It's the same thing. If we found a way to tap into the four fundamental forces of the universe or light, like this guy said, if we found a way to tap into the space-time metrics that are around us right now, existing as invisible fields, which are energy sources, we could create propulsion systems that could take us from here to the other side of the universe, no problem. What, what do you think those, uh, those tic-tac objects are that the pilots are seeing? Uh, I'm going to just go with uh, false flag on those ones. I don't actually know. What do you think it is? What do you, what do you think it is? It's either, hat. it's either it's either China, it's either China or it's a uh, mm. blue beam holographic. Mm. Yeah, I think so too. There's lots of different uh, there's lots of different top secret projects that have yeah. been worked on by the, those companies and from DARPA. But even if that was anti gravity, saying it wasn't hologram, saying it is like some sort of anti gravity technology, like that guy Bob Lazar claims to be real. Yeah. Um, if it was aliens, how would how do they get here? Even if you were even if you were moving that fast, it would take you hundreds of thousands of years to get here from another star. Yeah, well, see, that's my thing. Is like I don't really follow the the usual narrative with the aliens anymore. With the greys, the little bulbous guys, mm-hmm. bulbous headed guys. I used to think that the greys were like real, right? They're, but I kind of view them differently now. Why don't you think they're real? Well, okay, I think they are real, but I think they, and this is going to be conspiracy, you know, tinfoil hat shit, but um, I kind of believe they're, if anything, they're from the future. If anything, I don't think they're interplanetary or interdimensional. I think they might be from the future. And the only reason I believe that is, is if I'm being honest, is because- So they're time travelers? <laughs> per se, yeah. And and I don't, I have no evidence to back that up. The only reason I believe that is because I follow um, in line with what Kredo Mutwa told us. And Kredo Mutwa was uh, the last Sanusi of the Zulu tribe. So the last wisdom keeper of the Zulu tribe passed away like in 2020, at like 90 something years old. And it was through him that we all learned about like the reptilians. David Icke interviewed him back in like the early 2000s and did this explosive three hour interview. And that's like where this whole reptilian thing blew up. You think that reptilians are real? Not really. No, I used to. Not really. Not really. I mean, 
I, it's because it's fascinating stuff to like believe. Mm. Like it's fun to believe. Yeah. But I don't really think so. No, I don't okay. believe. You know, I don't really think that they're real. Um, George but, Soros could be a reptile. <laughs> I mean, he looks like one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he looks like one. But I, I, I kind of side with David Icke in the fact that you know, I mean, there's so much more to life on the visible spectrum in the light spectrum. So what he was saying was basically was like if you were on psychedelics or or if you were on higher states of consciousness and saw things with a different perception, people might actually look different to you. Mm. You know, so some of these guys like George Soros to us on this playing field might look like an mm. old ugly dude, but if you had like a higher perception and you could see like more energies or whatever, he might actually look really fucking demonic. Mm. You know, because right. of the energy he carries and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, but. As far as the UFOs and aliens, I think, if anything, the greys might be from our future. And that's what Kratos taught. Kratos taught that these beings are from our future and they're coming back to punish us. And that's why a lot of times the, abduction, the abductions end with like this weird brainwashing of the world ending. A lot of people purport that the, for whatever reason, these greys will like show them like images of the world ending. And right. That, of, that's what the Rua Zimbabwe encounter was. There was an event where there was over 60 school children um, on the playground that all witnessed the same thing. They all ca came running to their teachers saying that they saw a ship or, or a craft that landed outside of the playground. And there was these little gray beings with big eyes that, that walked out and were projecting images into their minds. Yeah. Like these images of uh, technology is bad. Yeah, I remember that one now. Yeah. Yeah, so Crater was and, saying and like it seemed that one's always boggled my mind because how how hypocritical is it that you're coming down in a spaceship <laughs> telling kids that technology is bad and technology yeah. is going to destroy the earth? Yeah, well let me let me break this down because it's deep, man. It's not it's not vertical, right? It's like horizontal. Like there's not like one thing going on. It's like a lot of things going on, and just in that one story alone. And actually, Carl Jung and I talk about this in my book. Carl Jung. Um, has a book about ufos and he states that ufos strangely started appearing for the most part in modern times right around the world wars mm -hmm. and um he thinks that they came through as uh, mass hallucinations right because that's all, what young thinks yeah because we all have a, again a central reality which are set which are collective conscious mm -hmm. interfaces with but we all have a collective subconscious that also interlinks we don't we don't uh, realize that mm. we don't realize that all of our subconscious are interlinked as well, and sometimes if if that subconscious hysteria is powerful enough, it can shoot out and project a hallucination. And so he thought that these UFOs were hallucinations coming out of the collective unconscious because at that time our world was ending. We hadn't seen something like that ever. You know, I mean, everything around everybody was just was was dying. I mean, there was, you know, bombs, airplanes overhead. So for everybody, the world was ending. And so there was such an unrest and that, such an unease in the unconscious that for whatever reason, it projected these UFOs. And and he thinks that another reason for that is that um, our minds were expecting a, me, a, a messiah. And we're, we're always expecting to see a messiah in the skies mm. coming down from the skies. And that might explain why these these crafts are like strange. They don't interact with us or anything. They're just moving around. Some know? people claim to get abducted, though. Yeah, that's a whole that's a whole other thing. But um, and I'll get into that. But strangely, recently I tried to make a compilation video of UFOs. Right? I was like, let me let me go out and make a cool like compilation of UFOs. If you go out and try to find any video of a mechanical craft that you can call legit, you 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 won't be able to find probably more than five, if mm -hmm. that. Right. What you will find is hundreds, if not thousands, of videos of these light orbs. Right. These strange light orbs. And that's been going on for hundreds of years. There's a report in the medieval times of exactly that, of like hundreds of people witnessing these like light orbs dancing in the sky and like fighting each other, or so they thought they were. So, whatever these light orbs are, they've been around for a long time. The mechanical crafts, I think, for the most part, are psyop if not hallucination. But what are real and even more strange than, than the mechanical craft are these light orbs. What are those? Hmm. And so getting back to the grays, 
Um, if they are real, which they, apparently they are because a lot of people have seen them and been abducted by them, I think that they're probably from the future. And I, I only side with Kratos on that because he's, he was more wise than me and had an actual experience himself. And he said that they're from our future because, again, yeah, they come here and they warn us and, and they reprimand us for what we did to ourselves. You know, because we look like this now, but, you know, if we keep on the trend of like social media and technology and becoming more transhuman, we might shift and change into something, you know, a lot less human than human looking and might end up looking like them. Well, if we could genetically engineer ourselves to be able to travel across massive distances through space, we would want our eyes to be big so we could see more, see and see maybe, you know, different types of light. Yeah, I don't know, man. This is all just conjecture and speculation. Like, I've never had an experience. I've never met anybody that's, that's had one, you know? And it's a strange thing, man. And what's even weirder for me is, like, I haven't heard anybody bring up the Greys recently. That, that was, like, the huge thing in, like, the 90s right. and 80s. Like, where are they at now? Right. Where are the Greys at? Mm-hmm. You know? So that's just kind of, like, uh, strange to me. But, again, like, all of this it's possible and starts to make sense once, once we realize that we're actually consciousness. You know, we're actually consciousness, we're in experiencing this as a simulation. But getting back to the, uh, the propulsion systems and the unified field, you know, NASA, for example, has a paper coming from the 70s titled uh, Field Resonance Propulsion Concept. And in that paper, they talk about exactly this. If we can find a way to tap into the energy field, we could create propulsion systems that can shoot us across the universe, this, this, and that. Mm. And the Defense Intelligence Agency has a paper from 2011 on the same thing called uh, the Quantum Tomography of Negative Energy States in the Vacuum. So they've been studying this for decades and decades, as this guy probably told you. You know, how can we tap into the energy fields around us and utilize it as a vast ocean and, and sail through it mm. like a boat in water continuously running off the water it's moving through? Right. And so we're starting to, to, to realize that this is probably how these UFOs are doing that, if they are real mm. to begin with. And again, there's so much there, right? Because some of these could be mass hallucinations. Some of these could be future travelers or, or just demons coming in and out of dimensions. And to get into the demon part of it real quick, there was a CIA paper titled uh, Analyzation or Assessment of the Gateway Process. Uh, have you heard of it? No. It was declassified in the early 2000s. It was written... What was the paper called? Uh, the Assessment of the Gateway Process. Assessment of the Gateway Process. Okay. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. So it was written in the 80s. Analysis and Assessment. Oh, look. CIA.gov, baby. <laughs> yeah. So I recommend every. Can you zoom into the top of it? ...to read this. I think everybody should read this. It's only 30-something pages. 30 pages or so. Hmm. Okay. I did a documentary on this too on my channel and um, basically what this paper was written as an assessment of the work of Dr. Robert Monroe. Dr. Robert Monroe used to be a radio broadcaster who realized something Whoa. significant what about is this? his brain. What is this? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. This Basically this paper tells you that our entire universe is a hologram. That's what it says. It says our universe is a hologram. Um, our body is a spirit machine. What was, okay, so I'm sorry, what was the premise of this study? What was the reason they did this? They studied this? So they put this together as an assessment of doc, the work of Dr. Robert Monroe. Okay. Dr. Robert Monroe was a radio broadcaster who realized something strange about our, our brain and how it responds to frequency. So our brains have two hemispheres, the left and the right, but they both respond to stimulus differently, stimuli differently. And frequency differently they're basically working um it's uh individually so they work individually but what he realizes if you can get them to harmonize through sound healing or sound frequency techniques if you can get them to harmonize and work together then your entire body starts to work in this very unified way where now you start to tap into these energy fields around you and you can induce lucid dreaming you can induce astral projection and you can actually leave your body and start to traverse these other dimensions that exist around us whoa look at that bro make that bigger Con the consciousness energy grid the left hemisphere consciousness energy 
wow, easy for you to say, the left hemisphere consciousness grid acts like the mind's computer software to reduce input from right hemisphere to verbal symbols and concepts. The right hemisphere uh, reduces reduces three-dimensional holographic images to two-dimensional. Go slash no. Now pause here for a second. Let me explain this because uh, so this is about infinity here. So I hang on, go go. Sorry, go back to that last one one more time. I want to. Can you go to the right a little bit so it doesn't cut off the end of that? It's oh, it's cut off in the paper. Okay. Reduces three dimensional holographic images to two dimensional. There's a lot going on in there, man. So if you sorry go back to cut you to, off. Now you're good. So all right. So this is where I wanted to give you the evidence about our memory existing after death. Okay. And to help you with this idea that after we die, it's nothing. So, okay, again, everything vibrates, right? Everything is vibrating, everything's resonating. Mm. Our consciousness is resonating. That's just how this stuff works, right? It all started with the cosmic ether, the watery darkness, and the own vibration that brought all this into existence, all right? But every waveform has two rest points, which is at the top and the bottom. Mm. And those rest points uh, would constitute um, a death because when things are not resonating, you know, when particles aren't moving, they secede from this reality. But they don't just disappear. They go back to source, to infinity. Because in this reality that we are contained in is where time and space exist. Time and space is a program. But the opposite of time and space is not death. The opposite of time and space is infinity. And infinity, if we were to look at infinity on an oscilloscope, it would look like a straight line. In this reality, everything vibrates. You know, it's, it's chaotic, it's movement, everything's shifting. But infinity is tranquil. It's where everything resists, exists for, for all eternity, whatever that looks like. So what Robert Monroe realized was that if you can get your brain waves, which do exist, to vibrate at such a high level that the rest points at the top converge to the point where if we were to look at it on an oscilloscope, it would just completely dissipate into a straight line because of how fast it's resonating. You could transcend this dimension and go into infinity. And this is where meditation comes into play. And this is the point of meditation, of, of uh, sacred astral meditation you get the brain waves moving so fast that you don't have the ups and downs you have a straight line yes and that's when you go to infinity yes but this sounds like some scientology shit bro <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's it's yeah it, but this is this is really how it works man like this is reality man you know we we have a well brain. i mean it's a fucking cia research paper <laughs> Right, because I mean, we we have a we have a brain, right? And for for the past hundred years or whatever, Einsteinian science has been telling us that we're just a physical body with the brain, and our brain is a computer, and it creates the illusion of consciousness. But that's not true. We now realize that it's the opposite. Consciousness is who we really are, and we create this reality, and we interface with it. And this has actually been proven. This was proven last year. In 2022, October of 2022, three scientists won the Nobel Prize in physics for proving this. And how they proved it uh, was through proving that quantum entanglement is real. So yeah, the, describe quantum entanglement. So quantum, enta <clears throat> sorry, quantum entanglement is the phenomenon of when two particles become interconnected to the point where if you were to place them on the opposite ends of the universe, they could send instantaneous information to one another. Mm -hmm. That's quantum entanglement. Right. And according to the laws of physics, the Einsteinian laws of physics, that would be impossible. Right. But this was just proven real last year. And these three scientists have been trying to prove it for decades and they finally perfected their experiment to the point where it was infallible or whatever. Like it mm. was... 100% correct. Yeah, Michu Kaku has a new book about this called uh, this Quantum Supremacy. Yeah, so we're realizing that um, the universe is, is not locally real. I saw Joe Rogan post this, and this is what led me down researching this. He posted the, the article, the universe is not locally real or not real. That's what everybody was saying. What? The universe isn't real. But it was kind of a play on words. There's the whole telephone thing 
thing again. Yeah. Because um, the the actual headline is that the universe is not locally real, and locality is a physics term, a quantum physics term. So locality is the Einsteinian science. It means that you know everything's physical. We mm -hmm. just we're just a brain. That's locality. Right. Non-locality means that anything's possible. That consciousness is the driving force of reality. So, for example, two particles talking to each other on the other sides of the universe, that's non-locality, it's non-local. So these scientists prove that we live in a non-local universe, that two particles can send information instantaneously faster than the speed of light, no matter how far apart they are. So this opens up a huge discussion as to what can we do with that? And if we're just consciousness, if all we are is consciousness, which is an etheric form of something, then how can we tap into that? How can we tap into that as an energy source? You know, what can we do with that? We can do so much with that. And w for example, these UFOs, whatever they are, they've probably already, already figured that out. They've, ar they've already figured out how to use quantum entanglement, the four fundamental forces of the universe, and also their consciousness as a, as a controller for that. And getting into Nikola Tesla, you know, he figured this out also. Nikola Tesla talked about us being a human machine. He realized that we were an engine. He called us a little engine. And he, he spoke about there being a force. Again, all these scientists always realize there's some force that's holding this all together. And he called that the luminiferous ether. And he correlated that with the Hindu Akasha, the Akashic records, which is basically the, the Hindu version of what I've been talking about, this underlying force where infinity exists, where everything is interconnected. And uh, in 1938, he gave a presentation just five years before he died, where he stated he had just made two great discoveries. He didn't want to say exactly what they were in that moment. He was always like that, kind of like always like hinting at it, trying to like, you know. Yeah. So he said, I just made two great discoveries, and one of them had to do with gravity. He said that I just disproved all the theories of gravity. I know what it is now. And the other theory, he said, has to do with all of reality, from the most minute particle to the biggest of structures. That's all we know. And then he died five years later, never telling us what those discoveries were. But we can assume from what he was telling us and what he already understood was that he probably came to this conclusion that all around us are these four fundamental forces of nature, but there's also one interspersed in between all of them and that we are not physical, we are consciousness. And that if we find a way to implement our consciousness into these other energetic fields, then we can toggle through this reality with immense power. And we can do anything we want. Anything. But I believe, for one, the powers that be don't want us to be that powerful. Who are they? Well, in simple, the globalists, you know, Bezos, um, I don't know, probably, you know, Putin, Biden, I don't know, just all these, these guys that you see on TV, right? All these leaders of the free world, leaders of the corporatocratic institutions. Um, I have a documentary where I actually get into these actual names of the globalists. Um, but uh, it's probably too much to get into right now. But the globalist uh, philosophy is a fairly new philosophy that got started in the 20th century. And there are very specific men who, who, who got the world going into this institution of, of uh, one world government or whatever. For example, um, at the Tavistock Institute, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the Club of Rome, all of the founders of these institutions were the guys who like started getting all this going. And Klaus Schwab was a student of these people. Klaus Schwab was a student of Henry Kissinger. Um, and when he, started his, when he started his World Economic Forum in the 70s, he had um, Aurelio Pecci, the founder of the Club of Rome, come and fill in as, as the keynote speaker for like the third seminar of the World Economic Forum. So Klaus Schwab, although he looks like he just came out of nowhere, he's been doing this for decades and he's been looking up to all these globalists his entire life, wanting to recreate what they've been trying to do, which is interconnect all the governmental institutions into one so that they can rule us much, much easier. Mm. So they don't want us to expand our consciousness and realize that we're more than just our body. You know, there's that. But I think there's a higher purpose. I think they're just doing their puny little reptilian human thing. And I think that the creator, you know, God, has intended for us to get to that point where we realize that we're consciousness and that we realize that there are energy forces around us that we can tap into. I think it wants us to get to that point. And I also think um, that UFOs and crop circles are a part of that. 
I think that when they come in and out of our reality, they're helping that. They're, they're broadening our conscious awareness. They're making us realize that, that it's possible. Us seeing it happen is almost like telling our subconscious we can do that. So I think that there's a slow process that our God or our, our Creator has intended for us to go through to get to the point where we can realize in full who we really are, what it really is, what all this really is. Mm. And there's a, there's a teaching in Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, that talks about this. It's called the, um, the Shavira, the breaking of vessels. In that tale, we are told that God created a universe before this one and that it put it little fragments of itself, of its light, into its creations. You know, it gave it its spirit into its creations. But its spirit was too strong and everything blew up. Everything blew up. So it had to recreate a universe. But this time it created what is known, it, it, uh, it performed what is known as simsum, self-limitation. So it only put a little bit of itself in everything because its power is too potent that everything would just blow up again. So in this theory, I believe that, you know, God is, is vague. God is like in the background or whatever, but it's, it's, it's God's intention for us to slowly evolve. If we, were, if we were to just come down now and be like, yo, I'm God, I created you, check this out. We would blow up, our minds would explode. Right, right. <laughs> you know, so I think it's all these little instances that are slowly leading up to the point where we fully realize who we are, what we are, what this is, and what death is. You know, I don't think death is the end. The CIA paper tells us that this is a hologram. There are different dimensions. And in the, in the CIA paper, there's one sentence in, uh, where it is stated that the practitioner, the meditation practitioner who, who's ascending to different dimensions must be you know, ready and prepared because sometimes you will encounter lower vibrational entities. And so to answer your question earlier, do I believe in demons? Not in the Christian sense. I think that there are lower vibrational entities and yeah like can, what what's a lower vibrational entity man okay so getting into like uh well first of all first and foremost we need to realize that this reality this dimension this universe isn't the only one as crazy as it is to, to wrap our head around it's just the truth mm -hmm. it's not you know even in the physical sense there are there are colors we can't see there are sounds we can't hear right. there are different dimensions yep um and as we're starting to realize the dmt dimension right might be an actual place that we're going to mm -hmm. that's what they're trying to map out our dreams are sometimes an, an actual place that we're going to because we're not our body we're our consciousness it's just that we get trapped here and stuck here that we can't toggle it we haven't we haven't built up that skill to be able to toggle through these things yet and so in these different realms i think thoughts can become beings it's it's a theory it's a concept known as an egregore an egregore or archetype like lucifer for example i think can actually become self-aware if given enough energy it's like ai you know ai can one day have consciousness even by mainstream definition because by mainstream definition states that any complex nexus of of uh, computated sensory whatever brain networks can conform a consciousness an illusion of consciousness right mm -hmm. ai can one day be conscious by mainstream definition it'll be an illusion of consciousness but it'll have one you know but i think even in reality and in a real sense i think in actuality ai can actually have a consciousness one day it can actually be given a spirit of consciousness and actually think for itself and i think in that same sense in these vague, weird, interdimensional places like the DMT realm, our dream realms, where our thoughts and fantasies and nightmares and stuff like that exists, I think if given enough power or energy, some of these thought forms like the boogeyman or the, the clowns in my nephew's closet or whatever, these demons that I thought I was being visited by as a kid, if given enough energy and time, these things can develop self-awareness and can become lower vibrational entities because everything's vibrating what constitutes life is the spirit the vibration the physicality and the mind right those those three fundamental forces of the ancient matrix so if given those correct ingredients i think these thought forms these demons these whatever wherever they exist can actually become self-aware just like ai they might not have a lot of capability the only capability they might have is just to just knock over something in your house or visit you at night as a shadow, 
you know but over time these things can become more and more self-aware and develop more and more into conscious beings hmm so lower vibration meaning that that sound wave and then yeah. higher vibration meaning becoming a straight line and being turning into infinity is that kind of what you're referencing well lower vibration is kind of it's kind of just a descriptive way it's not like an actual like vibration but it's more like a description oh. you know like lower meaning that it's like it's it's like a it's just like demonic it's ugly it's it's lower you know mm. it's lower than it exists in like a in a more ugly lower place you know because mm -hmm. if we want to view it as like a vertical plane yeah man so i th I and i again i've had experiences throughout my life where i've astral projected once or actually twice i astral projected uh when i was like 16 years old and um when i astral projected i went into my hallway and i saw like this figure like this dark shadowy it was just a how shadow. did you astral project <laughs> And what, uh, what what made you want to do that? I didn't I didn't do it by will. So the first time I did it, I was about 13 years old, and um, I, at the time I was reading the Emerald Tablets of Toth, which Billy Carson talks a lot about. Yes. And so I was reading that, and it kind of was like really you know freaky and weird and, and dark. And so I didn't finish it. I kind of put it away and went to sleep. And I had my first astral projection experience. I didn't know that that's what it was, but looking back, that's what it was. So what I, what happened is I woke up having to go to the bathroom got up and i was like okay i'm gonna go to the bathroom but as i got up to go to the bathroom i kind of just floated to my floor like as if i was in water and i was like okay i must be dreaming this is a dream it's got to be and i kind of just laid on my floor and i could see like the hallway and then i woke up in my body or so i thought i was like all right let's go to the bathroom but the same thing happened floated down as if i was in water okay i'm dreaming again the third time i finally woke up everything kind of sped up and it was, i was back in real life and i went to the bathroom didn't think much of it. And then three years later, when I was 16, um, I went back to the Emerald Tablets of Toth and tried to read it again. And then that night, I had another astral projection experience. But this time, I knew what it was, so I knew what was happening. So I got up out of my body and regrettably didn't turn around to look at my body, but I moved through my room. I made a right, and I was like, oh, dude, I'm astral projecting. Like, it was everything just kind of slowed down. You feel as if, like, you're in water, like time doesn't exist. And uh, I was just like a consciousness. And so I, I remember going to my door and moving through my door. And as I stood in the hallway, I saw this just dark energy. It was just like a shadow. Didn't have a face or anything. It was just shadow, lower vibrational entity, hmm. right? And in that moment, looking back, I think it was a test per se, because in the Emerald Tablets of Toth, the author teaches you how to uh, vanquish these entities, he teaches you how to vanquish them using your mind power. And so almost simultaneously when I saw it, it's like I felt like a laser beam shoot from the book to like whatever my heart center was at that time and just like quickly downloaded it. And then I shot like a beam of light at this thing and then it just disappeared. And then almost instantaneously, like I woke up in my body and I didn't think that was real. I was like, man, there's no way that just happened. You know, <laughs> like I was like, that's that was crazy. Like, but I, I went to sleep. And the next morning, my mom took me out for breakfast, and uh, she asked me, she's like, hey, is everything all right? I'm like, yeah, everything's cool. And she's like, are you sure? Because last night, I walked by your room, and I felt like such a dark presence that I had to stop and pray for you. And in that moment, I got the chills, and that's when I was like, okay, maybe that was real. Like, maybe that did happen, you know? Um, what, what was the entity? What do you think the, the dark entities are? Okay, so at that time, I was 16, I was on house arrest, and it was like summer at 16 yeah <laughs> what were you on why were you on house versus 16 so dumb i uh, me and my friends uh stole a golf cart took it for a joy ride <laughs> we took a golf cart for uh for a joy ride dude this is gonna sound really weird but i did the same thing when i was 16 and got arrested for that <laughs> no way same exact thing what that is weird but i never was on house arrest <laughs> well okay so I, I got on probation and then i uh I popped a dirty drug test and then got on house arrest during probation. Oh, that's it. Gotcha. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, it was crazy. But uh, so I was on house arrest and I was just, I was researching a lot of occult stuff. I was writing a story at the time, like a fictional story. And I was researching a lot of grimoires, like demonic books, because I was looking for like inspiration for like character development and like names and stuff. Mm. It was a weird time. So I was like practicing like kind of like light magic and shit. And I remember it was just a really dark time. Like I remember feeling like strong energy in my room and I had some weird relics in my room and stuff. And so I was kind of calling it in, kind of getting back to that idea of egregores and archetypes. And 
I think uh, for me, I think like 95%, if not more of the paranormal experiences that we have in life are our own subconscious minds projecting mm. that. And it, it, it can become powerful. The subconscious mind is very powerful. And I think it's so powerful to the point that it can actually influence conscious reality right. in these egregores, in these spirits, or in things moving sometimes. Mm -hmm. I've seen things move as a kid. I can't, I can't, you know, verify it. I can't, I have no way to back it up, but I've seen things move, you know? And I, What do you think all these people claiming they're being abducted by aliens? What do you think that is? I think a large percent of it is probably hallucination trauma and there's probably a small percentage of it that is that is real they're going through something real whatever that is i don't know like mm. again I, whatever these grays are they could be like these lower vibrational entities breaking into our reality for a small period of time or they can be these interdimensional travelers from our future mm -hmm. i don't know but i think a large percentage of of these experiences are our own minds playing tricks on us yeah yeah, that's what uh, that guy, John Mack, the Harvard psychiatrist, was studying. He went to Zimbabwe to, to interview all those kids that were on that playground. And uh, like he set them all aside individually, interviewed them all, and they all drew pictures that were like very, not the same, but very, very similar. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, that was like when he started talking to all these people and like seeing the commonalities between all their stories, he was like, you know, he wrote a few books about it, but, you know, he was, he was convinced that, you know, these were, this was reality for them. Yeah, man. Yeah. Cause again, getting back to the central reality, like the central reality is like the mundane narrative that we're, we're just a citizen in a country mm. and we have to go to school and work, you know, like that's like the central reality, but life is way more spectacular than that mm. in many, many ways. And so we're being held in that illusion that that's all we are. We're just a person. You know, that's it. That's all good. Nah, like we're a consciousness like toggling through this program and our creator, whoever or whatever it is, put us here for a reason. And I think that reason is to slowly bring us up through development to the point where we can finally accept and uh, receive, you know, what this really is and who it really is. Mm. And um, while we're here, though, we are uh, being taken advantage of through the physical aspect because our brain has compartments just like the mind does. The brain has what is known as the, the reptilian brain, the R complex. And the R complex is where all the primal instincts reside, as you were saying, you know, sex, money. Right. So the R complex is uh, taken advantage of by all of the like networks, uh, TV networks, entertainment industry. They just try to like, they just market to our, sorry, our reptilian brain. Right. And that's what I call the reptilian brain network. Mm. And the reptilian brain, it gets evoked through fear for the most part. It's the easiest way to evoke the reptilian brain is through fear. And we're always constantly being, you know, told to fear something. You know, the past couple of years, most of the world was caught in fear. And so when we're in fear, we're not operating on a conscious level, on a higher conscious level. We're operating on the reptilian brain level. So the funny thing is, when you ask me, do I think reptilians are real? They are real. We are the reptilians. Mm -hmm. They're turning us into reptilians by keeping us in our reptilian brain complex. And so by us staying there, subtly, they keep us in a subtle, low vibration where we aren't operating on a higher level. And they do this through so many different ways. And depression is an effect of that. And the thing about depression that I talk about in my book is we're starting to realize that depression is not just an emotion. Depression is actually an altered state of consciousness. It's called a global state of consciousness. So being in a coma, being, through, being in a comatose is a global state of consciousness. It's a state of consciousness that takes over your entire body. And scientists are starting to realize that depression, again, is not an emotion. It's not like you watching a movie and you feel sad now. Depression is actually a state of an altered state of consciousness. So when somebody's depressed, their entire physical being and mind is altered and changed. Mm -hmm. They're not even operating on a conscious level. They're making decisions based on a lower thinking level. Right. And so this world, this central reality is designed through fast food, through corruption, through the entertainment industry, through social media. It's designed to keep us depressed. It's designed to keep us in fear. It's designed to keep right. us in a low quality state. I mean, getting back to what we were talking about earlier with organized religion and groups and society, 
look at during the lockdowns how many suicides there were oh yeah keeping people locked up in their homes you know out of public places not around other people i think i think i think suicide shot up by like an insane amount like it was like i forget what the number was but there was hundreds of thousands of more suicides during the years during the pandemic lockdowns than there were before yeah man yeah that was that was a nasty thing for all of us to go through you know and mm. uh but that that's the reptilian brain network man it's like it's 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 operated through the central reality and if we don't wake up and realize that we're more than this body and that our creator intended us intended for us to be more than this body eventually then we're going to just that's all we're ever going to be it's just this body and we're just going to be some civilian some anunnaki slave or whatever mm. But the body isn't evil, though. The body is meant to be used in this. The body is beautiful. It's it's designed perfectly for what we need to do here in this current program. Mm -hmm. And so how we ascend this is through the body and mind. It's through the spirit machine. So the yogis who have been meditating have realized for many centuries now that our body can produce some very amazing things that can help us break us out of the central reality and help break us out of the reptilian br brain program. For example, a lot of the poses that they do, the like the mula bandhas as they're known, a lot of the poses, they're not just like random poses they're doing. There's specific poses that help activate blood flow and circulation through the body, which is important because, um, especially in kundalini meditation, because we have what is called the cerebral spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. It's a fluid channel that you may know of that runs through our sacrum all the way up around our brain, in our brain, and back down. And the, cere the cerebral spinal fluid is uh, responsible for discarding bacteria, viruses, and also um, dispersing like benef beneficial vitamins and, and uh, things like that. Uh, but it can get clogged. It can get slowed down and stuff like that. And um, in some places, sometimes people have like blockages and it can cause like aneurysms or just like defects, mental defects, brain defects. And so when you put yourself in certain yogic poses, what you're doing is allowing your body to clear that channel. And when you breathe, when you do certain like yogic breathing techniques or breath work, you're allowing that channel also to open up more. And more than that, we have what is called the vagus nervous system, the vagus nervous system. And it follows the cerebral spinal fluid. It starts at our sacrum and goes all the way up to our brain. And the vagus nervous system touches all of our internal organs and our brain. And so it's an internet channel from our brain to all, to all of our organs. And so when we meditate in certain poses and do breath work, we're opening up the cerebral spinal fluid, we're cleansing out our vagus nervous system and clearing out our brain. And, and when we couple that with a conscious eating and conscious thinking, then what we're doing is we're changing our energy field. And that's not fanatical hippie stuff. We have an actual electromagnetic biofield. Mm. That's real. And so when we get back to harnessing our spirit machine and clearing it and taking ownership of it and doing these practices that you know, yogis and mystics have been doing for thousands of years, what we start to do is we start to clear our subconscious mind where the, where is, where the program resides, right? We start to clear our subconscious mind, which is where the program starts. So when we start to clear our subconscious mind, we can start to regain independence in our consciousness, in our soul. And we can break apart from the, the reptilian brain network and the central reality. And further than that, what we should be doing is is strengthening our consciousness. Uh, Pierre Chardin talked about this. He's the famous Jesuit mystic who said, uh, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm -hmm. He talked about individuating our consciousness. The more we individuate our consciousness and the more we create that connection with our body and our mind and the more we meditate and start to realize, actually realize, and expand our conscious awareness and realize that we are more than this and start to see that, then when we die, we'll be ready for that. Our consciousness will actually transition through that easily in the same way that when we fall asleep into a dream, we forget who we are. Some people don't. If you practice lucid dreaming, you can, you can fall into a dream consciously throughout the whole process. It's the same thing with death. If you prepare your body and your spirit machine for that, when it happens, you can hold on to your mind and go through that process and break through and retaining your mind 
and be ready for whatever that is on the other side. And this is evident in nature because again, we're consciousness. We're not our body. When the body dies, we don't die. It's just that we don't practice the skill and technique of, of realizing that we're the consciousness so that when we meet death or whatever that transition is, because we're operating on a low reptilian vibrational level, mm -hmm. that high vibration that we are met with, which is infinity, simply sees us, seeks and, and pretty much evaporates or washes it down. You know, it, it uh, yeah, it sees the low vibration and it blocks it, it rejects it. You know, we're not, we, we, we're not ready. So we come back, samsara, 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 reincarnation, until we get to that, to that level where we are actually consciously aware and know that there is more because we can see it. When you astral project, when you meditate, when you lucid dream, you can see it. You, you actually can see it and know that there is more. Mm. It's like that door that I talked about earlier. You know that behind that door, I know there's a couch there and there are a few beautiful people and I'm going to walk through it. How does knowing that change your day-to-day -day life, your perspective? Man, it just makes things a lot funner. You know, it can. I mean, for some people, it makes everything more grim and depressing. And I went through that when I was, you know, starting all of this years ago. I went through a depression stage, where, a, a stage where I thought I was going crazy. Like I was like hearing voices and stuff mm. and like having hallucinations, like my mind broke. And uh, I had to take a break. I was like, man, I, I got to stop reading. I got to stop looking into this stuff. I just, I didn't want to talk about anything more strange than the weather. Right. Really, man. Like, but. Yeah, it drives a lot of people crazy, man. Lots of people can get like, especially like, depending on what drugs you mix with it, the schizophrenia is a real thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was always afraid of is schizophrenia. Because I've had two friends that have been diagnosed with it. Mm -hmm. One of them, uh, rest in peace, he, he passed away. He spiraled too mm -hmm. out of control and yeah weed like like marijuana and psychedelics aren't for everybody some yeah. people just weren't made for it absolutely man but uh yeah i mean a lot of people in the community they they see they they learn this stuff and they get bitter they get bitter about the world oh everybody needs to wake up the sheep the sheeple yeah i don't view it that way man like you know not everybody's meant to know this stuff either you know and and, and that's why i approach this stuff kind of treading lightly and, and as I can but you know for the warriors that are ready you know to to take on the truth about religion to take on the truth about our government to take on the truth about life and consciousness you know this will be for them but not everybody needs to know this you know like I don't need to run into my mom's house and start telling her all this stuff you know like you know she's she's got her little life and she loves it mm -hmm. you know and and, and I, I believe that as long as she, we love our lives and we love the people around us and we, we strive to, to be as good as we can, then that's, that's good enough. Mm. But for me, for whatever reason, the creator endowed me with this ambition. I couldn't run away from it if I wanted to, even when I tried to stop because I was going crazy. Eventually I had to come back. Mm. How did you come back? How did you overcome it? Oh uh, man, it was, I just took a break. You know, I took a break, but everywhere I went, I just saw little signs. And it was funny, actually, I went to a used bookstore and because I love going to, to bookstores just to kick it and cruise and find find some stuff. And I was in the bookstore and I, I found like a, a collection of, of Zechariah Sitchin's books, mm. like eight of them, eight or nine of them. And they were all for like a dollar or 50 cents. And that was like a gold mine. You know, Zechariah Sitchin, his, again, he's the guy who brought all this Anunnaki stuff. And I, mm. I love his work. So I was like, man, I can't just let this you go. You know, I have to buy these. You know, at the time I was broke. This was years ago before I started like making decent money, and I spent pretty much all I had on that. And I took that. I took that as a sign, you know, to get back into it. I'm like, this, this has got to be a sign. So I, I bought the books, went home, and just meditated. You know, just said, all right, I'm ready. Like, I've had enough. I've had. I've had enough time during my break. Mm. Just went full force, and ever since, it's, I've been diving deep and deep. That's incredible, man. Well, hey, man, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate you sharing all this information. Where uh, Tell people where they can find more of your work, more of your videos, all that stuff. Absolutely. You can find me at uh, on Instagram at uh, Esoteric Eddie, uh, YouTube at Esoteric Eddie TV, and pretty much everything else, my books and some of my merch at uh, EsotericEddie.com. All right, man. Thanks again. Hey, thank you, man. Thank you. Thanks for everybody.